like I said, our yeah. All right, folks, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome, everybody. It's been a while since we've been uh, here in person. It's good to be back at, uh, at Landry's. Um, I will caution you, we might be a, a little bit out of practice on some of this stuff. So if there's some technical difficulties, you'll just have to excuse it. We're, we're just going to blame anything that happens like that on Bert, you know, that it was, it was his fault. So you're, you're the designated fall guy today, uh, Bert. So we appreciate you doing that. Want to uh, express our thanks to our uh, sponsors, uh, Transpac and uh, DTEC. Uh, both uh, both are going to be participating in this today. In fact, uh, I'm going to bow out of here pretty quick because Chris Webb uh, with Transpac is going to uh, be the host today. So uh, with that being said, we have, uh, um, this is what we're going to be talking about today. The genesis of this was kind of interesting. Chris and I had a conversation, well, probably two or three months ago now. Yeah about the uh, various aspects um, <clears throat> from, a, from an, uh, an insurance standpoint of uh, the risks and rewards of running a uh, rotary steerable. And from that, it, uh, it kind of took off. As most of you know, rotary steerables are becoming more and more popular, uh, running on, uh, on an even higher percentage of the wells. And interestingly, they generate a, a disproportionate amount of the revenue. Uh, for companies that do that, they tend to be a little more expensive. So if you look at uh, some of the Spears reports uh, numbers, uh, you'll see that they, uh, even in North America, are generating in the 30 to 40 percent of the amount of revenue for the directional drilling business as a whole. So with that, though, of course, there is also the risk that goes with it, because if you stick one of those things, it's going to get expensive pretty quick. So uh, that's a little bit of the background of, uh, of where this kind of started from. And I think this is going to be an interesting discussion. Um, we have a number of people that are joining us online on Zoom. Uh, the bulk of the people will be here in the room. So I'd like to encourage you, if you have questions or comments, uh, go ahead and, uh, and speak up. You know, we'll, we'll go ahead and do that. Uh, we have a very uh, kind of loose itinerary you'll notice that there's no real timings on this we have kind of a mental timing but uh, uh we're gonna let this discussion kind of free flow a little bit and uh because i think that's the value of this type of thing so you're gonna see information here that uh you probably haven't seen before uh, so i think it'll be, it'll be good to that so with that i'll introduce chris webb and i'll let you uh, take it off Oh, yeah. And okay. You good for that? That's good. All right. All right. Good morning. Uh, Jim and I, he came up with this creative, catchy uh, title here Don't Screw Yourself Into the Ground. So basically, we talked and Jim said, I don't really have a um, dog in the fight between rotary steerable versus uh, conventional BHAs. Basically, uh, Transpac managers, we've been around for 30 years and we just ensure tools that go downhole, whether it be drilling, logging. So it doesn't matter what type of tools are used, we, but we collect data. And so we've been doing this for 30 years. We've insured thousands of wells, um, hundreds of claims. So the data that we collect is what I'm going to kind of share with you and also some data that I've found around. And uh, we'll just kind of walk through some of the numbers and uh, just kind of give you a little oversight on, on how it is that we see um, rotary steer versus BHA from a loss and hole risk. All right, Jim, I'm just moving up and down here. Oh, did you? Oh, it went back to the slide. Yeah, I'm sorry. I looked up at it and didn't even. I think I'm going to have to drag this over. All 
I told you we're out of practice, right? Somebody tell me when they see my mouse pointer come across. Huh? I'll try not to breathe in the microphone too. You know, I've, okay, there's my mouse. Is it on the screen? Because I can't see the mouse. No. Nope. It's right the top. Where is it? No. Yeah, I can't see it. Here, it's on the, there. you're on the top toolbar. Uh, ah, I see it, yeah. I thought that was a fly. I did too. <laughs> there we go, and now we got it. Okay, thanks, man. All right, so now I can just sit. All right. Well, I don't know about you guys, but the future is uh, slowly uh, looking much brighter. Um, I think the oil and gas sector is uh, dusting itself off, springing back to life. Uh, we can tell our economy is bouncing back. Economy is bouncing back. And uh, if you uh, follow LinkedIn, you know, all those little green dials around people's names is starting to go away. A lot of people are finding jobs. There's a lot of job posting. So uh, I know just this past week for us, Transpac, we've finally been busy. You know, I've had a full day's worth of work and it's been a, it's really nice to have that. It's great to get back to work and working hard. Um, so the future is looking bright. So I just pulled this off just so we could kind of do a little then and now. This is uh, the Baker Hughes rig count. So this is one year ago, 6-11-2021 uh, versus 6 11 uh, 2020. Sorry, I didn't change the date there. So in the U.S. rig count, we are now up 65% from one year ago. Texas rig count up 92%. Hermian rig count up 72%. Uh, Eagleford up 153%. Haynesville up 48%. The price of oil one year ago today, or as of Friday, was $37.12. And as of Friday, I, I don't, I didn't see what it was today. I know we hit 72, but as of Friday, it was 70.91. So that was a 91% increase over one year. So I know there's kind of a saying, right? That uh, I, I can afford $3 gas, but if you're in the oil and gas industry, you can't afford $1 gas. Um, so that, that's the truth and, and things are looking much brighter. $70 is a really nice place to be. <clears throat> So today, what we're, overall topic is basically going to be rotary steerable, not really verse, but compared to uh, conventional BHAs or mud motors and uh, MWDs, right? And so some of the topics that we're going to discuss are the reliability, hole quality, availability, time to drill, and loss and hole. And the reason I highlighted loss and hole here is that's what I'm going to discuss in my little section. And then we're going to turn it over to other presenters um, who are experts in the other fields. So the elephant in the room, loss and hole risk are always the elephant in the room before a drilling pro program gets started. Everyone talks about the money saved by cutting days off a drilling program, setting drilling records, um, using the newest technology, but no one wants to think about the costs associated with these tools if they become damaged or lost down hole. The cost of managing loss and hole risk is usually not planned for. It comes up at the last minute uh, leaving companies with no time to find solutions to reduce their exposure. And at Transpac, we know this for a fact because many times we get a call on Saturday afternoon or Thanksgiving afternoon, you know, it's a very last minute to, they need insurance and the tools are about to leave the yard and they have to get this coverage in as soon as possible because they forgot to get it in place. And this happens all the time. So really, in our view, from what we see, companies are not really doing a great job of planning or mitigating the loss and hole risk. They're looking at a lot of the other factors, but not looking at the scenario of what happens if we lose this tool in the hole. How does that gonna affect our company and our drilling program? So what I did is I, I got with Mike. Mike is my, Mike Webb is my father. He started the downhole tool program over 30 years ago. So he's been doing 
downhole tool insurance for 30 years. And so when he, he got started, which was in the early 90s, the typical coverage requested was for a motor and what they called a steerable tool. So it wasn't even an MWD at this time. And the motor averaged about $30,000 and the steering tool around 80,000. So you add some other miscellaneous tools. So a typical request would come in for a loss and hole of about 125,000. So this is in the early 90s, right? And these are typically land wells. So we didn't do these big, we, our data is not for big monster wells, offshore things. This is typical land wells, Texas, Canada, and this area. So now we move on to, you know, around the 2000 time frame, And the typical request was now the MWDs come into play and the motor was about 60,000, MWDs about 150,000. You add on some miscellaneous tools. So now you're looking for a coverage of about 225,000 to 250,000. So that's the loss and hole risk. So in just about 10 years there, it almost doubled, right? But still compared to today, that's really low and, uh, for the value of the tools. So now we start getting, and, and you know, these dates aren't exact. So you may have the tool rotary serials came in at 2008, 2000. So I'm just kind of giving you about the time frame. So about 2010, um, MWD motors were definitely the most common tool that we were insuring at this time. And so we were in a quest usually between four to $500,000 for MWD motor. And then, you know, that includes your stabilizers and uh, jars and different things like that. But those were the main components, the main cost for the MWD and motor. And so, you know, about that time, we're looking about four to $500,000 that people are looking for coverage. So you can see every 10 years, it's almost doubling the value of the tools. So also about this time is at first we start hearing requests for rotary steerable tools. Um, and all of a sudden we start getting requests for around a million dollars. So up to this time, we had always offered a coverage limit of about 600,000. So for 20 years, that had been sufficient to cover any tool loss and hole exposure that anybody needed. But now all of a sudden people are wanting million dollars of insurance and the insurance companies are like, whoa, I, I can't risk a million dollars on one well to get three or four days of premium, right? So we, we kind of ran into a little problem here once these new high value tools came on the market. So presently we are seeing pretty even, I would say now maybe even rotary steerable is taking, we're getting more requests for rotary steerable over the MWD and motor, but it's still pretty consistent. It's still getting almost maybe 40, 60 uh, requests. And uh, the, the uh, motors and MWD still steadily increase, but you know, still we're in the five to $800,000 range. And you, know, you might be able to find a little bit cheaper than that, but that, that's the typical range we're getting. But the rotary steerable with all the new technology is the one that's really just blowing up. So anywhere from 1.5 to 3.5, I would say even sometimes we see larger than that, million dollars of loss and hole risk when they're using a rotary steerable assembly. So, so, and then I have another one, as you can see the pattern, the tools are not getting cheaper. So I don't even know what the future holds. 10 years into the future, if both continue to double or grow 50%, you know, you could be looking at a million dollar mud motor and MWD assembly and you know maybe four to five million dollar rotary steerables i don't know maybe maybe they'll go down and as they get more efficient with the uh, building of them but it as you can see by the chart it steadily goes up every 10 years the value of these tools so basically what the tools were the very were basically the first factor that we use in determining loss and all risk basically we have to know what is the value that we're going to responsible for that was the first factor the second factor we need to look into is the cost of drilling so just for this example i'm going to use the permian since that's basically the uh, the you know that's where most of the activity is happening right now in texas um Total well costs are between 6.5 to 8.5 million. And I got this from the uh, EIA trends in US oil. And, but I had always thought it was a little bit higher than that. I thought it was about 10 million, um, but that's what they said. So I used it since I had actual data to back that up. Um, drilling costs account for about 30% of the total cost. 
and those drilling costs that they're including in there, are all your rig related costs and your casing and your cement. So using that data we just saw, we're gonna go through an example. So we're, if we're in the Permian, we're drilling a Wolf Camp well, the total well cost, let's just say it's gonna be 8 million to drill this well. So that would mean my total drilling costs are gonna be 30% based on those numbers we just used on the previous slide of 8 million. That means we have a drilling cost of 2.4 million on this well. Now, if we, a BHA loss, we just talked about the BHA loss exposure, can be anywhere between two, 800,000. I think I, we even said it could be up to 3.5 million, but I think in the US, 2.5 million is, is sufficient to use here. So you can see one, lost tool can be the same amount as my entire drilling budget on a well. So if I lost this tool, will I be able to drill the next well? If I'm a small mid-size operator, will I be able to drill the next well? Will I have to pull wells off of my drilling program? So what can we do to mitigate this risk? And that's what we'll look at soon. So the third factor we're gonna look at so we've looked at the cost. What is my li liability downhole? We've looked at second, how, did, how does this affect my budget? What is my budget? And third factor we're gonna look at is the well risk, okay? So 10 years ago, yeah, sure, sir. I have to share the screen here. Okay, now I gotta get my mouse back. There you go. Okay, we're set. Okay, give me back to you. Yeah. Uh, okay, so let's look at the well. This is well risk, well profile, well design. This is what we're looking at. So typical wells that we used to get, and, and remember we do typically land wells, right? In, in US, Canada, you know, Europe, that type of thing. So 10 years ago, an average lateral was between 1,500 to 6,000 feet. Uh, total measured depth, usually between 9,000 to 15,000 feet. Uh, the big one is casing depth, used to be between five to 8,000. So usually what we almost always saw was people casing either up to the build or through the build. Um, so that was leaving us with an average open hole between four to 7,000 feet. So the current trend is wells are getting longer, much longer. The new tools are allowing people to drill farther out. So we're looking at average laterals between six to 12,000 feet. Uh, now total measure depth has increased to between 16 and 22,000 feet. But the big catch, the big risk factor that we're seeing is not only are they getting longer, but they've re now reducing down the casing. So you open hole, Okay, so now most casing is, there's a little bit of intermediate casing that's being set, maybe 1,500 to 3,000 feet. We even see wells now that they're only worried about surface casing. They're just, you know, protect the water, put surface casing, and then we're just going to drill open hole all the way. Um, you know, they're, you, the mud type has changed. A lot of times we're using oil-based mud, which is good, but then even a lot of times guys are trying to cut costs and see if they can do it with some type of uh, water-based mud. So now the average open hole has increased from 9,000 to 15,000 feet. And these are not even extended reach wells. So you get into extended reach wells and, and that open hole even increases uh, exponentially there. So all this adds up to making each well riskier. It, the risk increases in each well. So now you've, through the years, we are increasing our cost. Um, the cost is affecting the drilling budget, becomes becoming more and more of the drilling budget. And the wells that we are drilling are becoming, to save money and drill faster, are, are riskier than they used to be. We're, we're taking more risk in the wells that we drill. <laughs> it stopped uh, responding.
fucking slide anyway. All right, I don't need you guys' help again. There we go. All right, there we go. There we go. So all this uh, data can lead to a stressful nights for your uh, your risk managers, your drilling managers, uh, the tool companies. Um, choosing the right tool is not just about what tool will perform best. So that is definitely the main factor that. Uh, you know, operators should look at which tool is going to perform and give me the results they want, but it shouldn't be the only factor that they look at. Companies must understand the loss and hole risks so that they're able to plan and mitigate these risks before they take place. So they need to look at, as we discussed, what is the liability exposure? What is the cost of the tool to me if I lose it? What, how will a loss and hole event affect the budget for this well and future wells? And how risky is the well? Do we have experience drilling these type of wells? You know, what is our loss record? So is this our first time to drill this well with a brand new tool we've never used before? The risk goes up considerably. The first time people use the rotary steerable tools, it has been, you know, they really have to do a lot of planning and have, uh, you know, somebody who really knows and understands because drilling with a conventional tool versus a rotary steerable, there's a lot of differences they need to make in their drilling process. Um, that's when we see a lot of the, the, the claims is the first time they're switching tools, the first time they're switching to a new area, um, the first time they're changing their mud over. It's anytime, you know, once they get used to drilling a well a certain way, there's usually uh, a, a comfort level that gets built. But whenever you make any changes, that's when usually the problems occur. So experience in an area with a tool is a, is a big, big, uh, big help. And then how do we cover sales? What is available to an operator and a contractor to mitigate this risk? You know, contractors often offer loss and hole. Um, there's downhole tool insurance. Um, if you've got big bucks, you can uh, even self-insure your tools, you know? So those are your kind of your options you have to mitigate that risk. But Data is the key. So at Transpac, I'll just give a little plug and tell you why, how we know this data. I kind of did a little bit, but we're a specialty insurance company. We focus solely on providing coverage for loss and hole risk. That's the only thing that we do is just loss and hole risk. So we talk daily with directional drilling contractors, company men, engineers, consultants, insurance agents. They're looking to see how they can reduce their exposure for themselves and their clients. So we've been insuring uh, these tools since 1991. Like I said, we've insured thousands of wells. I think we're now up to uh, 8,000 wells that we've insured. We paid hundreds of claims. So we collect all this claims data. We review through all of our claims data to find patterns and uh, see if there's any common causes happening as the industry changes. So we've used this uh, data to develop a proprietary underwriting engine, which we use to evaluate these risks. So let's move on to, I know most of you guys, everybody in here knows, so I'm gonna kind of go through these slides a little quicker, right? But this presentation, you never know who's gonna be in, in the presentations if they have a clear understanding of what a loss and hold risk is. So quickly, just um, we'll discuss what the risk is for drilling or logging tools if they become stuck, lost, or damaged. So. Most people really only think about if this tool becomes stuck in the hole, right? That's my loss and hole risk. But a lot of the times, not a lot of the times, but it is frequent that these tools could not even become stuck, but just get damaged. So if you have a $2 million tool in the hole and it is damaged, you may not be responsible for uh, 2.5 million, but you know, that could be a still a considerable amount. You could still be paying well over a million dollars just to fix the damage on that tool. So any, uh, any loss and hole risk, it, will, it is excluded in your commercial policy. So you operators sometimes think they're covered for their downhole tool. Well, there is a, a exclusion for anything downhole. So you are not covered in your commercial policy for any type of downhole tool risk unless it specifically somehow states that. So every once in a while, I'll pop in and offer $100,000, right? But for the tools that we're talking about now, $100,000 doesn't do, buy, do anything for anyone. <clears throat> so
So what are the main causes of losses that we're seeing? Main cause of loss is mechanical sticking. Uh, this is generally where the well bore packs off around the drill string for many different reasons that could happen. Um, looking at our claim data, this falls into three main categories. Uh, the biggest issue is hole cleaning. New tools drill much faster. We've got long laterals, means of flow rate, and the hole cleaning need to be adjusted to match these new demands. Uh, companies are under pressure to go fast and hole cleaning can be neglected or, or rushed. Uh, another one, when we're moving into new areas, we see this a lot is using the wrong mud system. So you use, you're down and you're not in the formation you expected. If you use the wrong mud, that, that well is just going to cave in and collapse on you and disintegrate. And once that happens, those tools are gone forever. Um, a loss in hole event can be extremely costly for everyone involved. If you can't get unstuck, you not only have to uh, pay for those tools, you got a fish, you've got your rig already there, you've got your, um, all the companies there waiting, so you're getting charged your day rate. Um, you wanna sidetrack as soon as possible because you're already paying for everything. So all these costs, there's a, even though we talked about the cost of the tool might be two million, you have all these other costs also building up and really the loss and hole is the only way you can recover any of these costs is to get these tools paid for. All the other fishing and everything like that, there's no insurance product or any type of loss and hole that you can get to help you recover those costs. So all those costs are gonna add up. So a stuck event can be way more costly than just the tool value. Um, another uh, cause is differential sticking. When we first started this, probably 10, that was our primary cause of loss was differential sticking. Um, but that's really fallen off. We, that now probably accounts for 10% of our losses. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of go, I've kind of done this presentation once for IADD before. Um, so I'm gonna go through this a little bit quick because maybe there's not uh, as many people here that saw it originally. But basically what we're gonna do, we're gonna review claims. Um, so for this presentation, we look at data from our last 15 claims. This goes back about two years. And I've excluded all claims where there were wireline or cool tubing. So all the claims that we're gonna discuss here are just drilling tool claims, okay? So what we're looking for is common trends such as location, time of year, um, hole section, depth, BHAs, cause of loss. So as we expect, you can't really point your finger to just one thing. There's many different reasons that go into why a loss occurred. And usually it's kind of like building a story to figure out what happened in this well by reviewing the logs and you have to kind of go back and um, build, build the story of what happened in this well before these tools became stuck. So first let's look at loss location. So of the 15 wells, Five were in Texas, two Oklahoma, one Colorado, uh, one Louisiana, one Pennsylvania, and then we also had two in, uh, two Canadian, one Australian, and one in Trinidad. Um, the wells in, in okay. Trinidad hey, kind of did a, uh, all change. About seventy percent of the wells were yeah. U.S. based. Two eight one, Canadian, eight six five, ten twelve. Eight six five, ten twelve. Good. 76286. Somebody's not on you. On the Zoom, I think. <laughs> so, so we have a pretty accurate representation. So you can see it, it pretty much happens equally across the world. Downhole tool losses is not to one geographic location, right? Um, this is happening everywhere and it's and it's a risk everywhere. Um, this was an interesting one that we had found is the time of year. So time of year is one of the most uh, interesting ones that we had. So, and we aren't able really, we haven't found a root cause for why this is. So in the months of September and October, over 40% of our claims occur. So we don't know, is it heat? People are getting tired, people on vacation. That, that was one of the, the interesting things. So if anybody has any insight on this, but should be just two months that we cover 40% of our claims is interesting. Yeah. Dude. Okay. Okay. 
That's interesting. That is so. I, there's people on Zoom, so I'm gonna. So Dicky, for the people on Zoom, what Dicky had said is that uh, this is the, the the changeover between the third and fourth quarter, where the operators are really looking at their budgets, and based on how they've spent so far that year, they're either gonna throttle back or throttle up. Um, kind of that's the gist of it, right? And, and, and that causes bringing people on quickly or. Uh, having to, to bring in new people, new startup. Also, uh, it's in high demand at that time because people are trying to use up their budgets for the year. So that's that's a really interesting insight. So what he's really saying is September and October is duck season. Duck season, <laughs> yeah. And then in the last year, we've got the snow melt. We've got the heat in those areas of Canada, Pennsylvania. They're going to wait until after all that is done because winter is so cumbersome and expensive in the snow. Right. They'll wait until June, July to start up. Right. So like Canada's they're just starting up this week. Yeah. They're coming out of their breakup. So they're starting in June. And it's going to take them two months to get to the battle and then they're going to have stuff like September. Okay. So, so they're also saying that due to, uh, in some of the colder climates, the breakup, um, this is basically about the time period where they're really ramping up and getting into the, uh, the final stages of their wells where we see the most common uh, time for our claims <clears> or <throat> losses. It seems like if I, if I take time off, it stops. Can you see? Huh? You see it? All right. There we go. Okay, good deal. So what we we often get requests from clients is that they only want to cover the lateral section of a well. So they're like, well, we don't feel there's any risk in the build section. So obviously, the very few people insure the vertical section unless they're putting some expensive tool, because usually um, that's a pretty safe area that they're comfortable with. But uh, there, there's a lot of requests. We just want to insure the lateral section of the well. And we tell them, it's amazing. There are a lot of claims that come from the build section of these wells. Are you sure that's what you want to do? So you can see that we had uh, on this, one only one loss came in the vertical vertical section that was a big long deep vertical well right so it was not just a you know eight thousand foot vertical well this is a deep vertical well where you could have some risk so that makes sense um but there's out of this we had four that were in the build and 10 in the lateral section so based on the data 30 percent of the wells losses came in the build section of the well so you know uh, there are also some issues in the Permian that we have seen because on the way down and through the build, you're going through a lot of depleted zones. So that adds a lot of risk as you're moving down, getting through those depleted zones. So th there's different factors that, uh, th that makes the build just as risky as the lateral section of the well, right? Especially when you use less and less casing. If you cased all the way up through, now maybe it's different. But when you're leaving all that hole, open hole, the build section becomes just as risky as the uh, as the lateral in most cases. So the data here proves that we what we tell everyone, there's always risk when the tools go down hole. Many areas based on the conditions, the build can actually be even riskier. And that's what we just discussed. So typical wells, 
um, that we saw have a depth between 10 to 20,000. So of this data, a typical well was 10 to 20,000 total measure depth. And most losses occurred between five to 15,000 feet. Um, so not as many as at the beginning as we expected, but also not as many at the end. And one of the reasons for that is usually you don't get stuck at the very end of the well. You're, it's as you're tripping out of that last phase of the well, that's where you become stuck. So, so you may have drilled a 20,000 foot uh, or 10,000 foot lateral, right? And then as you drag back, you become stuck at 7,000 feet into the lateral. So that may be why you don't see a lot of claims at the very end of a well, but it's more, they may have drilled all the way to the end of the well, but they actually don't get stuck till they pull all the case, all the cuttings are, you know, consolidated about 3000 feet back. And that's where you become stuck. Um, BHA type. So this is kind of interesting for this forum. So our, our category is basically into the two, two uh, columns, conventional and rotary steerable BHA. So, Conventional BHAs were used in 10 of the claims and rotary steerables were used in five of the claims. So um, due to the much higher replacement cost of the rotary steerables, though, they actually account for a higher percentage of our, our losses paid out. So the money paid out, even though they're only involved in half the claims. So there you go. You have your, um, we did see more of the conventionals that were actually stuck, but the rotary steerables due to the cost actually we paid out more, you could say the money paid out was more for rotary steerables. So you had more losses for conventional tools, but more money paid out for rotary steerable tools. Chris, for your insured well, do you have a percentage of which you would say that the insured was a rotary steerable? Was it about the same proportion to the loss that was just covered? I would, I don't have that like official number, but just off the top of my head, I would say, um, it's changing as we go. We are getting more and more rotary steerable. Only, you know, it, rotary steerables are taking more and more of the request. So the percentages are, you know, it used to be straight B8 um, conventional and 10% rotary. And it's just slowly, I would say we're almost to the 50-50 point at this point. So, but as the trend goes, the rotary steerables will pass the BHAs. And that doesn't mean more people are using it. It's just more... More people are requesting insurance for the rotary steerables than the BHA. That's what that means. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so here is our cause of loss. Historically, over the past 30 years, we've seen mechanical sticking account for around 50% of claims. However, we're seeing a uh, concerning trend moving to almost 90% of claims are a result of mechanical sticking now. And most of these can just be contributed to operators trying to drill fast. Um, they're just worried about ROP, um, getting that well done in as few days as possible so they can move on to the next well. Um, they cut costs, they're cutting costs as in casing, um, cheaper mud, um, those type of things. And, and that just increases the risk um, that we're seeing in the wells. So how much are you willing to gamble? How much of your AFE are you willing to gamble? A stuck tool event can cost you, we just talked about, 15% of your well's total AFE, or we said 30, we showed you how it could be almost 30, the exact amount that you put into your drilling budget for the drilling part of your AFE. Um, as a contractor, are you losing business because your lost tools cannot be replaced in time for the next job? So I could see this being a problem. You know, there's a lot of motors and uh, maybe in my mind, in my, is there's a lot more conventional tools out on the market because they've been around so long. But the rotary steerable, they keep getting uh, more and more advanced and people want the latest and greatest. So I don't think there's as many on the market. So as if these tools get stuck, then there becomes less inventory. So that's a question I have later for the guys is how do we, how is the inventory? Are, are they able to keep up with the demand of these tools being locked? Not only more people want to use them, but also losing these tools. So that's something we can come to back. That's a question that I've always had. Um, so if you're actively drilling, it's not a case as if, as if you'll lose a, lose a tool, but you will lose them. Current trends are showing uh, one in 30 horizontal wells um, are losing a tool. So I, re I recently had received an application from a um, large service company. And they were mainly, the, what they were showing me is how many wells they were, had drilled in the Permian. And it was about a 200 well program. And they had lost eight BHAs during that time, okay? 
So if you do the math, that comes out to about one in every 25 wells, which is exactly, that was his numbers, right? And it backed up the same numbers that we see, which is about one in 30. So now people don't request insurance for cookie cutter vertical wells. So, you know, you got to think these are horizontal, standard horizontal wells done in the normal place. So you can't throw in like easy, um, you know, straight vertical little, um, you know, wells, things like that. But, but in a standard drilling programs, this is what we're seeing. <clears throat> How much time do I have, Jim? Do I need to speed it up? Over? Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, you, you, all right. You want me to keep going? You, you want to pause it up? Okay, okay. All right. So, the, oh, just in time for the plug, right? Yeah. Oh, gee. Gee. <laughs> well, basically, to reduce your risk, right? You're, you're a small operator, contractor. You might require a letter of credit. Um, so, you might need to, to be able to show that you can pay for these tools before a contractor will let you rent them, right? So how could you do that? One way is with an insurance product. Uh, maybe you have cash flow and you don't want to have, if you lose this $2 million tool, you don't want to have to go back to your investor and say, hey, uh, to get that sidetrack done, I'm going to need another $2 million, you know, or whatever your cut is to get this uh, well finished. If you had mitigated that risk and already uh, bought some type of product like the insurance product, then you would, the insurance company would pay you instead of you having to go back to your investors. Um, and a risk allocation. So you can develop a strategy at the beginning and you can, a lot of people wait till the very end and they want insurance and they're like, well, that's too expensive. Well, yeah, because nobody budgeted into their cost. Everything else you budget in, you know, price of iron and steel and all the tools are very expensive, but you budget it in. So if you were to actually think about these risks and, and mitigate them and budget these costs in, then, you know, you're not getting hit with this, these uh, insurance premium at the last minute. Um, for contractors, um, a lot of times this can be, insurance can be combined with a contractor's LIH because if you have a million dollar, $2 million tool, a contractor LIH will only cover usually 50% of that. And so that's still leaving the operator with a huge exposure. So if you combine an insurance product with LIH, that might get your product, your tool completely covered um, and reduce that risk. <clears throat> So let's speed it up here. Okay, so this is kind of what we just talked about. These are your different, these are your three options that you have. You can either self-insure the tool, you can get the contractors lost and whole, and they each have their advantages, right? Um, obviously, if you self-insure, it's much cheaper, but you have to remember to put that money aside um, so for that rainy day when that loss does come. Um, a, a loss no contract will usually be about 50% is the most that they'll offer. Um, they don't usually cover damaged tools. Um, and the wording is different with each contract, right? It's their own in-house thing. It's not insurance. They're just reducing your contractual liability. So you really need to check on the wording on what each one is saying, what they're actually covering and how that, and how that comes into effect. Do they require three fishing attempts? I've seen some that require three fishing attempts and you have to latch on to be considered an attempt. I mean, a lot of the tools that we get stuck, they never can even get back down to those tools, right? So they would never ever, this, the loss and hold would never come into effect in that case because you were never able to latch on. Um, insurance, usually there is always a limit that you can get. So typically you're looking at about a million dollars of insurance is the most that you could get in insurance. Um, usually has a 10% deductible. Um, you're charged a day rate and premium. Um, they just require you have to get the, to try and get the tool out. You can't just walk away from the tool. And uh, damage is covered under an insurance product. Um, let's see, I think we've kind of covered this one. Oh, this is just basically showing you some examples. Um, so this would be your loss and whole liability. So if you were self-insuring, obviously, and it was a million dollar tool, you would be responsible for the full million. And the second example, if you were buying the contractor's LIH on a million dollar tool, um, you would, the, the LIH would take 50% or 500,000, you would leave you responsible for 500,000. If you were to buy insurance on a million dollar tool, the insurance could cover you 90% and that would only leave you with 
hundred thousand dollars of liability or if you did some type of combination where you maybe you self-insure fifty thousand uh buy insurance for some and then get your loss on a full contractor now look at your the green line is your actual exposure and look how small um so these are different ways that you can mitigate exposure um with your drilling program let's see so we don't really need to do an insurance checklist um, we've talked about a lot of these things takeaways um, the downhole tool losses happen frequently can happen anywhere in the well um, you need to make a plan to mitigate your downhole risk operators should budget in the cost to your afe so it's not an unexpected cost contractors should offer multiple coverage options to their client so a, a contractor can offer downhole tool insurance to their client right they can offer their lih so they can offer them so is it hey i have a 50 percent option and a 90 percent option so you can offer that out to your client um, to, to give them different options just so they can pick what risk they want to take on. And of course, uh, if you have any questions on downhole tool insurance or on loss and hold by the contract, I see these contracts all the time. So we'd be happy to walk through any of that and show you how to mitigate that risk. Um, you know, we're not just insurance. We, we see the whole well and we'd be happy to discuss it with anybody. So um, that's all I have. So what we need to move on now. Yeah. All right, so next up, See, we have um, Dickie's going to come up. Dickie Hall's going to come up, and he's going to talk to us about the value, the time to drill, hole quality, reliability, all that good stuff. Can I spill one of your slides? Let me go back. And yes, see sir. The causes for issues. Can I get the slides? Yeah, sure. That one or farther back? Keep going back. That's good talk. Good, that's Feel free. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I'm Dickie Hall. I'm retired from Southwestern Energy. I'm here basically. I'm the uh, the old guy that's been around for forever. So that's what that's what I'm kind of emulate. The interesting thing on, on the on Chris's talk, this is pretty similar to the same talk that I heard in 1994 about why do you want to use conventional steerable systems? And I say that because as technology has gone in the oil field, historically, the newer technology is more expensive. When we, look, we looked at the cost of a conventional steerable system with a, an MWD, sure it made it faster, went smoother, but everybody was scared of the lost in whole costs versus a bit how a bit how or a bit sub and a motor and and a steering tool because you could recover all that you could recover the important stuff the, the guts of it transpose yourself now 25 30 years later this is a very similar topic and where it comes from is the same rules stand for now as they did then it's how it's how you design and drill your well is the most, in my mind, is the most important part of how the, the, the risk you're taking. And I'm totally, I'm totally in favor of, of taking lost and whole insurance. I'm totally, and, and mitigating risk, the dollar risk piece of it. But the key piece is, then as now, it's not the hole you drill, it's the hole you keep that matters. And that's because of the paradigm shift that Chris mentioned earlier. The average drilling, the average cost of a well is anywhere from eight to as much as $15 million. The key piece is two thirds of that is the completion cost. That's, and that's the critical part of the successful well. That's been a big paradigm shift in, in during the time frame since I came into the, in, the industry. When I came in the industry, it was two thirds to three quarters of the cost of drilling. Completions was kind of almost an afterthought. I remember having a, a completions AFE that was about maybe $10,000, pop holes, pump 5,000 gallon acid and go about your business. That's different. While I was at Southwestern drilling, drilling horizontal wells in the Marcellus, I actually had a couple of wells where the cost of the water was more than the entire cost of drilling the well. That's, so, so now the paradigm shift is where you put the well bore, the, con the quality of the well bore that you leave the uh, completions group with 
That's the key piece. That's why you hear, you hear operators talk about dog leg severity or cumulative dog leg. That's why you talk, hear them talk about the overall quality of the well bore. And so that, that's the key piece. So that's why, in my mind, again, I'm gonna give you the experience of, of a person who's been who's a very strong advocate of rotor steerable, who, who has had some tremendous successes, also had some issues come up with rotor steerable. Chris is right, when you plant one, even if you get out of the hole, I, we, we had a, we had a uh, well where we drilled through a, 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 a fractured lime feature up in, up in West Virginia, recovered the BHA, got casing on, repairs on the, repairs on the uh, rotor steerable because we had to use, uh, I think we used 15, un, uninhibited 15% acid to spot to eat it up. We spent $525,000 just in repairs to, what, to, to the, uh, the housing that we ate up. So there is risk. But coming back, why do you use rotary steerable? It gives you a better quality well bore, in my, again, in my opinion, because you're, it's a smoother well bore. Can, I love, and I love conventionals. I, they, they, have, they have provided tremendous uh, step rate advances in the in directional drilling. But there is, there's their stair step process. That little, that little bit of cumulative dog, like even if you go in and wipe it out as you're drilling, still is there. We, we actually looked when Southwestern swapped over up in, the, up in the Marcellus. At the time when you figured all the costs involved in the drilling side, we were actually making money going to rotary steerables in 2015 at only 5,000 foot of laterals. When you figured in the cost of the, of the drilling, the cost of cement, the cost of mud, the cost of disposal. This is, that's a key piece there. Cuttings disposal in different areas can be a huge, huge cost. So when you play all those together, we, Southwestern made the decision to go to rotary steerable. And it wasn't really an easy decision. It was a leap of faith for us because Southwestern was a, was a conventional steerable company. We had drilled over 4,000 wells in, in the uh, Fayetteville Shale with conventional steerables and had had tremendous success. Again, we've had statistically, we had problems with well bores, wells getting stuck, losing DHAs, but we were we were convinced that that conventional steerable was the way to go. In 2015, with a, with a major acquisition in the Southwest Appalachian Basin, we made the swap over to go to rotary steerable. What it did is it allowed us to drill in ways that we had never considered. M much as again, I'm gonna for reference back to what Chris said. He said the average well is 6,000 to 12. For me, the average well is 12 to 15,000 foot of lateral. And I was working, same thing, same as it, working with about 1,500 to 2,000 foot of surface casing on a 25,000 foot well. Kind of, kind of get, as a drilling engineer, that gives me a little bit of pucker factor on that. So it was key for me, so it's key not only to get it drilled, but more importantly, to get it cased and cemented. Because if I cannot provide a well, a good quality well bore to a completions team, then I've, I've wasted money. I've wasted that, that two and a half million dollars is a is is a good write off or something like that. Because if I if I if I if I go in and, and put and put a well that it can't be properly com completed, not only am I putting at risk the two and a half million dollars of well, I'm putting at risk that six million dollars for the rest of the well, the completion, as well as return on investment for, for having a poor quality in, uh, uh, completion. Those are key factors that come into the paradigm shift. It's, it's been a big change for the last 30 years, actually, like, actually the last 15 to 20 years as, as the industry is focused more on unconventionals. Prior to that, shoot, yeah, drilling, drilling was, the, was the, the major piece. We all we looked at that, we knew that. In the last 10 to 15 years, no, it's not. So let me talk a little bit about, again, the Southwestern, why it was a leap of faith. Prior to 2015, we had tried to make rotary steerable work. And our results had been, if I want to say marginal, I'm probably being optimistic. We drilled, I think, three or five wells, two in the Fayetteville Shell, or three in the Fayetteville, two, no, two in the Fayetteville Shell, three in another area up in, the, up in Arkansas and managed to, as Chris said, managed to lose two, via, uh, two t rotary steerable systems. And that was back when the company we were leasing from only had six in the entire United States. So 
we came back for the third time, not only were they were they unwilling to uh, insure, they, there was a hesitancy for them to even give us a tool. The, to them, getting the money back was, was one factor. Key piece was lost revenue. They, they could not get replaced the tools. So that becomes, that, that was a factor for them. So again, in 2015, we made the decision to, to roll into the rotary steerable. And it wasn't taken lightly. We looked at what the previous operator done. We looked at what other operators had done. That and and then com and compared them to what we were to what we were hoping to. And one difference was we were instead of looking at three to four thousand foot ladders, we were looking going in at six to seven thousand foot. So we felt like rotary steerable was going to offer us opportunities to 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 move ahead that we would that we would not have with conventional steerables. What we saw is that it actually worked. It, we we saw uh, we we saw improvements. We, we we had probably not too far off from what you're saying one in thirty risk of losing BHAs. Again, mostly because of lack of planning on our part and a lack of uh, insight into, into what we were drilling. As we grew as we grew more and more familiar, we learned what we where to go, how to drill, to allow us to get to to do what we needed to do. And I'm gonna point back up the slide. One of the key things is the mechanical sticking. And again, this is not new. Anybody that was drilling has drilled offshore can, especially back years gone by, drilling, this is a big deal, 3,000, 4,000 foot in one day and taking three days to get out of the hole. Because you could, because the, the same rules then apply now. You have to have the hole clean. You have to take care of, get, of, of, of how you drill well to not over drill your hole or not, as we said, drill yourself into the ground. That, that's the key piece. And that's, that's the issue you have nowadays is operators are trying to work, look for ways to cut, cut costs. It makes sense. If I can save a little bit of dollars here on the mud system, that's good. The issue is, does that put me at higher risk for Get for, for hole stability or getting it stuck. Another thing is again, the longer laterals. Uh, by the time I had left, uh, retired from Southwestern, the last well I had designed that was a uh, 32,000 foot measured depth, 25,000 foot lateral was basically six to 7,000 foot of TBD. And oh, by the way, it had 2,000 foot of back build. So not only did I start Instead of coming straight down and turning, I went backwards for 2,000 foot and then took it out. Those are the kind of wells that, that people are drilling because they, they're trying to utilize time to take up and get as much lateral as they can. Now, what, that well bore architecture adds complexity. Again, that's one reason why rotary steerables are popular. They have come into, they allow you that flexibility. They allow you to adjust as you need to. So that, that's, that's the reason we went with them. A third thing, that I, that I see for rotary steerables, and I'm projecting the future is, as the, as our industry becomes more and more into machine learning and, and artificial intelligence, rotary steerable tends to lend itself very well to that. I think in within the next five years, you're going to see the point where where the ability to send data back and forth from the, from the BHA to the surface is going to improve better than the current wire technology you have now, but there will be ways to improve it. With that, the ability to make the subtle adjustments that you need to make to drill wells consistently. And again, coming back to it, to get casing to bottom consistently and to get a, get a quality completion, quality well bore for completion is gonna, is, is the key factor that you're gonna see that, that those opportunities from that data that you can utilize and those, those real-time decisions that you can make to, be, to lend themselves more for rotary steerable. Again, how do you, so let's talk about, again, how do you mitigate? First, the very first thing, and, and uh, go, back, go back to some of the K&M training that I learned back in the conventional days, hole cleaning, making the mud systems, and I would say the, the wellbore architecture, Fault lines are, are, are issued or are an issue in a lot of areas, especially if you've got involved tectonics. But majority of our problems are keeping the hole clean, keep put, putting systems in 
put mud systems in that work within the formations. I mean, we've, if you've been on our rig, what we call unconventional, what we call quote unquote shale is actually geological hash. It's all sorts of stuff. I've, I've seen the clay contents run anywhere from 30% to 90%, depending on where you're at in that formation. As, as you go, as you go out in, into the Permian, as you work different, different, but the different basins, the different, even the different intervals within the Wolf Camp, you see a big changes in how the wells drill and what, what you're working with. So again, you have to have systems that mud systems, you have to have drilling systems that are compatible with that. That those, those are the things that from a from a, a drilling engineer standpoint, from an operator standpoint, that we have to mitigate. So that again at Southwestern, we focused a lot to do that, to mitigate the issues ahead of time, to think about what kind of mud systems that we wanted to have that would that would work. We actually had we we utilized a lot of what we learned in the in the Fayetteville as far as mud quality, as far as uh, flow rates, as far as just hole cleaning to, to increase the advantages. And ultimately it did provide us a lot of, a lot of advantages to us. As I said, we moved from, originally we acquired our, the, the property we did based off of 7,000 foot laterals. By the time I retired, we, our average lateral was, what was well over 12,000 and we were moving to, to probably closer to 15,000 foot. Again, I'm gonna tell you, Marcellus is an ideal place for rotary steer. Well, so I'm a little bit biased there. Other areas, you have to take a look, you kind of have to take a look at it. But it provide, but it, again, the ability to get the, gather the data to, and to utilize it to help you improve the next wells, again, it falls in place with the rotary steer. Uh, I think, I really don't have a whole lot to say other than that, other than I'm just saying, I believe that the rotor steerable is going to be the, the way that we're moving to. You're seeing that in industry. You're, you're seeing the trend up more rotor steerables. And part of it is there's more companies providing rotor steerables. One, I, I, looked at, I looked this morning in 2019 survey, they showed about, they, at the time showed about 10 companies that provided commercial rotor steerables. Probably a little bit light on that. Nowadays, there's probably at least 20 or more companies that are 23. 23, all right, thank you. 23 companies that are providing commercial rotary steerable systems. You don't do that if there's not a market for it. And people, and, and again, as an operator, as a drilling engineer, my, the reason I have, a, I'm given a market for it is because it works for me. It has provided, it has allowed me, it allows me to do a lot. Uh, I found rotor steerable systems to be very flexible. I've used them in mud, in brine solutions. Uh, I've actually drilled drilled one or two wells on air with a rotor steerable. So you have a lot of capabilities for it. And to be honest, we've only really been utilizing it now for five to eight years effectively. And over the next five to 10 years, if it, if it advances the way that the rest of our industry is advancing, you're gonna see tremendous things it can, can do especially with the ability to take the data and make real-time decisions on the fly with it, and which I don't see, which I think is one of the key benefits to it. Let's see. Uh, again, that's, that's really what's, yes, sir. So a lot of the receivable application right now, uh -huh. a lot of things that are being uh, cool, that are being combined with it, okay? Uh, how do you, how much do you That's gonna, again, it may be more depending on the area. My experience in, I'm gonna, Marcellus, they did not make that much difference. We, we, we were using motor assisted rotor steerable. Again, we, could, we, we were able to drill just a motor ship without, without any managed sticks, anything, anything to augment stick slip. If you're in an area like the Permian, where you have a lot more variation in that, or in say, you know, maybe, you know, I'm not, I've not ever drilled up in the scoop, but I scoop to me seems like it would be that way. I think there, it, 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 it could be a benefit. What you do is you, again, you can, it's kind of work if you, if you have the ability to look at and, and take the data. I mean, our industry needs to utilize the data being provided and, and, and do that to, to help us benefit from it. I think you can look in there, there are certain areas where I think it will definitely help. 
we we uh, we we saw we we've we've seen some improvement. We saw improvement, you know, in, in conventional. That's been pretty well documented throughout. And uh, other operators said they saw improvement in in their in their rotary steerables, especially and probably more so on getting casing to bottom, which in itself is an important reason to, to look at it. If, if it helps you, if it makes it easier for you to get casing to bottom, and you run you minimize your risk of damaging it. You you maintain your ability to for cape for pipe movement or pipe rotation during cementing. You paid for it right there. Yes, sir. So it's interesting when you talk about a rotary steerable because a lot of people think that all your problems are solved. You know, now I'm going to vote on a rotary steerable. My whole kitchen is going to be much better. I'm going to have a better hole than all these carrots out there that we can uh, grab on. But a lot of times, what you mentioned is the engineering that goes behind selecting that steerable. So I'm seeing a lot of is uh, drilling engineers and companies throwing everything over the over the fence to the, the providers, whoever so they may be, and relying 100% on their recommendations. Okay. Now they don't know all the idiosyncrasies of the subject. So I'm seeing a severe lack in engineer of the company you would be part of them, to compare the data and design the system to capture the system approach. And this goes all the way down to the bit, mm -hmm. what you're looking at, your stabilization. Um, for instance, let's say you, you get into cable. You think, okay, I'm home free. Well, you know, if it's at a high angle, it's that's the same pole cleaning column that drove the pole. Now I get in there and say, okay, I, mean, I know I need 120, 130 RPMs, whatever it is, in that hole. And here comes Lumber Day or somebody telling you that, hey, you can't rotate the tight taking with my tool. Most we can do is 60 RPMs or 50 RPMs. Now you can't clean your hole. Or you get into what you're talking about, you get into the lateral vibration issue where you get into stick slip issue. That all of a sudden, somebody's saying to you that I can no longer rotate fast enough to clean my hole because I'm going to damage the tool arm and get out of spec or I'm going to get into one of these high class uh, scenarios. Right? So the, the software is out there. The Slumber Day, the Bakers, the, the bigger companies have the software to model what sort of uh, vibration. Various tendencies that your BHA is going to go through at various RPMs, weight on bit, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And all that has to be done through bit selection, your stabilizer selection, um, your uh, um, the spacing of, of how all that's put together has to be done in a way to mitigate vibrations yep. that enable you to be able to stand in trouble with that tool or otherwise you can open up a whole new basket of problems when you're thinking that I'm going to solve all my issues with an RSS. So in the engineer system, you have to do the engineering before you run the and, and, and you can't always just take the 6.6 or whatever bit they suggest <laughs> because it may not be what's happening. They're always going to push it because they have a million of them. It's you know, a real simple thing. It goes back over the fence to you. Here's what everybody else is using. Well, it may not be what I need. You again, poor, poor engineering, poor design. Can't, there is no technology in the world that will fix that. If you don't, if you, if you don't cover your, yes, if you don't cover your, if you don't cover your your bases before you drill the well, you can't fix it with you can't fix it with mud. You can't fix it with RSS. Uh, you can't, you, there's, you can't fix it. And again, the key piece is if you don't, if you cause problems, there's a good chance, like you say, getting casing bottom, you can damage the casing or you can't, you don't get it to bottom and you drill 2000 foot out there that you can't use, which is a waste of money. Not only that, it also impacts the quality of the completion because now you've got open hole. 
down beyond and you don't know how your frac's gonna react to that. It's a key piece is, wellbore quality is the, is the key, key factor and you hit the nail on the head. If you don't design your whole drilling program around wellbore quality, mud systems, how you, the angles you build at, I mean, everybody knows you can catch up, you can, you, you can catch up with the rotary stroke to 15 degrees. How does that impact how you get casing to bottom? How does that impact how completions gets plugs to bottom or get the, does, their, does their work? You have, poor quality engineering doesn't, can't, can't be replaced. It, it is a factor and it costs money. That, you, that, again, I hate to say that that's the way it's been always in the oil field, it, but it is. If you, when you try to cut too many corners or, and it's probably even more a factor now because you have so many, so many operators have cut their staffs as short as, or as tight as they can. So you're, so, op, so engineers are managing multiple wells. They're managing multiple, not only are they managing multiple wells, there's all the other things that go into there that you have to deal with. Uh, I think it, uh, as I remember it, Southwestern before I left them, I averaged somewhere around 20 meetings a week. Scheduled, not, not, not just plain, that's scheduled meetings. So. So yeah, if I if I'm, if I'm talking about a 40-hour work week and 20 and 20 I got 20 meetings and average meetings let's say 45 minutes, that's 15 out of 40. That's that's a good. That's probably that's a third of the time I have theory, quote unquote, third of the time I have on, on, on to, to to do my work. So what gets caught again? You have the same time. You, you depend on someone else to give you an answer, rather than doing to, having utilizing the data to give you the to help you understand the right answer and help be a better engineering decision. Again, I think, I, I agree with you. I think that's why, why data management and data and, 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 the, and the data analysis that's, that's going on nowadays has become more and more popular. It's become popular. It's trying, to, it's trying to help engineers compensate for the lack of time that they have to do proper engineering. Anybody, any other any questions? questions? So thank you very much. Thanks, Dick. All right, uh, Laz just handed out the uh, menu. Just circle your selection, and then uh, they'll uh, they'll get that sorted out. So next, I'd like to invite Mike Broderick uh, with Merlin. And Chris Cuts to come up as well, please. They're uh, pretty proud of that air conditioner. I can tell. Is there any way to turn that down for a little bit? Yeah, you get chilly. <laughs> Must be. Could be one of sitting there. You're, you're sitting right underneath it. Huh? Yeah, it's blowing. You can see it's blowing everywhere. Yeah. That's how you guys sit next to me and sit yeah, <laughs> Okay. Yeah, it's not quite as cold up here. All right, I'm going to get him to find my mouse again. Uh, you just talk. Just check and see if we have any. All right, we've got all that taken care of. Yeah, if you, if you uh, So what we'll do guys is um, if you just want to introduce yourselves and then we'll uh, just a few thoughts. What you like to do, you'll be cameras right there. You'll be on. That was him. He just went sat down. Go ahead. Well, thanks a lot, everyone. So I'd just like to introduce myself. My name is Chris Cuts. I'm, uh, I'm with K&M Technology Groups. This thing doesn't pick up. 
real good. That's right. All right, try it now. How's that? You can get a little closer. How's that? So I guess on the, so thanks Jim for the invitation to come and talk about the risk and rewards on mud motors versus RSS from our perspective. So K and M, we've done we've done a engineering work with companies all over the U.S. and all over all over the world, um, and we we get this we get this question a lot from a lot of our clients. Which what should they use with with regards to RSS or mud motor? And I guess it comes down to the old saying of it depends. Um, if you have if you're drilling in a specific area where you have a lot of experience with mud motors and the crews are really good with mud motors, then I would by all means always say go with a mud motor because trying to take trying to, to take a specific tool and give it to somebody that doesn't have any experience with that tool it's not always going to work out the way you expect it to and to use the same use the idea that you're always going to get a you're always going to be able to drill a more efficient well with an rss we haven't always seen that because we've seen projects in offshore canada and in norway where they've actually been able to drill numerous wells with mud motors and adjustable gauge stabilizers faster and more efficient than they have with road receivable tools so realistically, if you have the right the right crews and you have the right tools, then then you have to do what's best for your business at the end of the day. Um, the the interesting thing that we've seen lately in U.S. land with regards to mud motors versus rotary steerables is when it comes to um, when it comes to stabilized assemblies, we're seeing that most of the time the directional companies and people don't like stabilizers. Because if you put the wrong stabilizers in a BHA, then it results in you being, when you go to slide, you jam off to the side of the hole, you can't get any weight transfer to the pit. And then they pull out of the hole, they take the stabilizers off, and then you start to get a more torturous well path, like what Dickie was talking about. Um, so we have seen on a number of projects where you do get um, lower friction factors and what we would call a better quality well bore with rotary steerable tools compared to unstabilized motor assemblies. We have seen this, uh, with, with numerous companies that when you have a properly stabilized assembly where you have integral blade stabilizers on the bearing section of the motor and then above the motor, and in some cases even running a third stabilizer further up the string to really stiffen up the assembly in the lateral section, that we see a, a less tortuous well path and a more uh, and, a, and a higher quality well bore where we see lower friction factors while tripping out of the hole and while running the casing to the bottom. There's some of you can hear that a well stabilized conventional BHA versus road preserve. Is there a, you know, a single digit percentage difference in bulk quality, which of course is kind of a subjective factor anyway. But, uh, it is a bit subjective because your friction factor is a more or less a fudge factor. It's not a coefficient of friction, but it's a more or less a fudge factor to try to get the get your, your actual data to line up with your model data. But it's but from from a, a conventional assembly uh, unstabilized assembly to rotary steerable, we were seeing maybe about a 10% reduction in your friction factor going to rotary steerable, and maybe an additional 5 to 10% going with a fully stabilized conventional assembly versus an unstabilized RSS. Okay. So it's it's not huge, but if you're drilling a well that has a 25,000 foot lateral section, right. then that additional 10% of friction reduction could make or break whether or not you're going to get your casing to bottom. The biggest thing well, to kind where of. Do you think that break It's really going to depend because it's so there, there are so many different areas like in in the marcellus we've seen friction factors are actually pretty low whereas in west texas the friction factors are actually quite a bit higher so it's it's uh it's very area dependent on what you're actually going to see from a friction factor standpoint it's also going to be dependent on what size casing you run in the hole if you're going to be running uh five and a half inch casing versus four and a half inch casing you're going to see a higher if you're using a soft string model, a higher friction factor because you're going to have those stiffness effects on the side of the pipe as you go to slide the pipe into bottom. So I guess what you're saying is that the difference between Marcellus and the Furman is that if you go Marcellus and all the other guys are on the Furman, that probably makes their situation worse. Whatever you say, Jim. There, there is your chance. <laughs> but the, um, and the one thing that I'd like to, Ask it on the on the insurance side because like to piggyback on it, no no amount of insurance is going to is going to make up for a for a poor well design. Um, yeah. If you don't have a poor well design, if if the people that are designing the well aren't fully competent and knowing understand all the different aspects about the well, then 
it's you might be able to get away with it for a while, but at some point it's going to end in tears. Um, the one thing that I find going from rotary steerable to or from mud motors to rotary steerable initially before it was motor assisted RSS, we had a lot better control of the bit speed. So then when you got to TD, you could circulate at the appropriate flow weight and rotary speed in order to clean the hole. Once we started putting high powered motors behind the RSS to get the, the performance, now we see it a lot where and as an operator drills to TD, they don't want to pump at the rate that they need to clean the hole or they don't want to turn at the speed they need to clean the hole because hole cleaning is all going to be driven by your drill pipe rotary speed, not by your BG rotary speed. And we've seen it a lot where they drill, they drill very, very fast. They'll even control drill for a certain amount of time towards the end. But if you're still generating cuttings into the well bore, that still has to be removed. You can't just slow down drilling for the last thousand feet and hope that you're going to clean the well. That helps to a certain extent, but there's still going to be a cuttings bit in the hole that has to be removed before you go to trip out of the hole. The, um, the, the biggest impact is if when you're doing that rotating off bottom, if you've got a motor with motor assisted RSSs, you could be spinning your RSS and everything below that motor at three, 400 RPM, which that's where you start to see all these tool damages where you're starting to see tools getting destroyed, uh, uh, rotary steerable companies not wanting their tools to be turned that fast because then they're getting they're getting damaged. And we hear from a lot of directional companies lately is that their biggest concern is tool supply. Manufacturing is, and manufacturing has become difficult for them. They don't they don't want to lose tools in the hole because then they don't have tools that they can use on use for additional for additional services for other customers. Um, so I would say that the biggest well if if you don't manage your ECD then if you can't get mud out of the hole, you can't get dirt out of the hole. And if you can't get dirt out of the hole, you're not getting your BHA out of the hole, and you better be buying insurance from Chris. Um, but but you are likely. <laughs> <laughs> to me, the uh, it's it's not always like when when you look at when you look at performance drilling with a mud motor. Yeah, motors are cheaper, so your your overall cost is less. But you also have a lower ROP when you have to slide. So when you take into account the, 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 the overall cost that you spend in terms of drilling, it may or may not be a wash. That's going to be up to the operator to determine whether or not there's going to be a, a cost benefit to going RSS versus rotary steerable um, or, or RSS versus motor. But on the flip side to that, when, it, when, you, when you, you can drill the well in, in a day, but it takes you a week to get out of the hole, then at that point, we've seen a number of operators start to go away from the motor assisted RSS and go back to just an RSS assembly where they increase their top drive rotary speed to make up for the difference to gain not the same drilling performance, but close to it. But then that gives them the assurance that they can rotate at the speed that they need to when they get the TD before they trip out of the hole to ensure that the hole is clean, that they can come out of the hole successfully. Any other points that you'd like to make? Um, I guess there's always the, the old question, especially here in the States, I see where everybody wants to drill as fast as they possibly can to TD and then clean everything up and put out the hole at the end. Whereas, you know, you need the proactive cleaning as well, don't you? Know, especially with an RSS. You know, one of the things that you have to take into account when you're looking at an RSS is bypass everything. You might maximize and all that. Stabilizers, fit, how well can those cuttings slow through the bypass area and the subclass area does it fit? To be able to get that thing out of the ground, just because you're drilling a, uh, a gauge hole, is that always better? Maybe not. You know, I mean, if, you're, if you have a, an assembly in there that doesn't have you know, the optimum bypass that you're looking for, nothing can travel through it to get it out of the ground, and it takes very little to get planted. And with these longer laterals, what you're finding is now you don't have as much downweight as you normally had before, right? So if I crawl into a cave and I get stuck, am I going to want somebody to come around and push me in the ass further into the cave, or am I going to want to come out the way that I was going? Well, when you get stuck in the lateral, you don't want to keep going on that thing and jarring up. More and more setting, you want to be able to slack off. If you can't rotate in a lot of cases, 
Yeah, very simple to say it's a slap calculation, right? So, uh, you know, another thing is you get into it, you can get into a oral tendency with these RSS. And this is where, you know, literally your VHA is doing this and it's creating a hole that is very erratic. And that's why you'll see in a lot of cases where somebody will sit and they'll circulate for days when they sit in, or here's, here's even a more classic example of what I ran into, where somebody circulated and rotated in optimum parameters for about six hours, and they're able to pull the stand that they had been working, and they got on the next stand and got over. So what explains that? What is that? It can't be whole thing. But yet everybody's coming back and hey, what's wrong with your That'd be whole thing. But it, you know, it, it, it can be how that hole was drilled and get into a world phenomenon, or you plastering with your plays, you know, what exactly is going on there. And again, all that comes back to life. Right? So now what you're seeing a lot of is people actually bite the bullet and saying, let's open our holes, let's go ahead and use an underreaper while we're drilling. Make it bigger so we can get our VHA out and avoid this risk. So it really is coming all the way back to the engineering and how to model that VHA at various RPMs, weight on bits, and formation tendencies, and all that, um, and figure out what that what that VHA is actually going to do, and be able to get in there and mitigate that phenomenon before it even happens. So you want to take that extra step. Going into picking up the VHA, running into the ground, lying on the, the service company to tell them what to do, and not really and not demanding to see, hey, what is this thing going to do at the parameters that we plan on running it at? I want to see, you know, the, the sinusoidal curves of how this thing's going to react to the various parameters. And you have to take that next step. If you don't do that, you can't get into a lot of trouble and start getting into some really strange phenomenon that's very difficult to, to, to explain. Like, how can I sit there and circulate for six hours, hold that stand, get on the next stand, and not be able to pull in? Well, you're you're right. There could be a number of impacts that right. go into that. It could be it could be issue with 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 poor bypass on your BHA components that you're interacting with any residual cuttings in the hole. Maybe you have a degree of well-worn stability that there it's a rock supply problem. It's not a it's not a hole cleaning problem. You you don't have enough mud weight to, to support the sides of the hole. The hole's collapsing, and no matter how, how much circulating you do, you can't always remove those cuttings out of the hole. Um, and contrary to what MI or Horizon say, there's nothing they can put in the mud to fix well-worn stability. Once it happens, it's happens, it's there forever. Um, The other thing that's also important to talk about the vibrations is, is how you go to bottom and how you come off bottom. Because Fred Dupriest talks about it all the time that uh, whirl or lateral vibration tends to occur at, at low weight on bit and high RPM. So if the plan to go to bottom is to have, start off with high RPM and then feather the weight down, well, you're not, you're already having a, a, an unstable bit engaging the rock and then it's going to start bashing your BHA around all the sides of the hole. Same with allowing weight to drill off at the bottom of the stand. If you just allow the weight to drill off at the bottom of the stand, then it's going to go from that stable period where everything's working just fine to go into a vibrating state. And if you just go immediately to pick up a stand, go back to drilling again, it can take some time for that energy to dissipate out of the BHA before you go back to drilling again. So proper, proper training for the drillers on how to go to bottom with higher weight um, and lower RPM at first, and then ramp up the RPM as you start to, as you start to drill and not allowing weight to drill off as soon as you get to the bottom of the stand, pick them off the bottom immediately so that you don't allow that weight to drill off and start to vibrate the BHA. Because if you do that on every single connection, then over time, you're just gonna beat the hell out of your BHA and it's gonna fail, or it can't fail. Or break. Or break. Chris, how, how open do you find that people are in the field with these types of operational suggestions? It's very dependent on the operator. We find that the operators that have a more um, uh, top to bottom approach where everybody is very aligned on what the on what everybody's workflow is and what their what the technical requirements are. 
essentially if the drilling manager just lets the engineers do their job and doesn't try to get involved, then things go a lot smoother. If there's not as much integration or understanding from top to bottom about what everybody wants to do and how they want to execute it, it just takes one person to come in to say, we're not going to do that. That doesn't make any sense. I don't understand. We're not going to do that anymore. Like one project um, that we were on years ago in Norway, they, uh, they drilled 17 and a half inch hole at 85 degrees and they had really a, a really crappy rig that didn't have very high flow rate and they circulated for three days before tripping out a hole. Now those three days that they circulated before tripping out a hole was that, that resulted in a record well. So they were able to drill the TD, pull out of the hole and run pipe. So from shoe to shoe, it was the quickest project that they had in that field because they spent the extra three days circulating beyond what the program had said. Now, that's not, that's an extreme case, but when it comes down to what people are doing, there has to be alignment from top to bottom. And when you don't have that alignment where the, where the organization is somewhat disorganized, that's where thing, a lot of the, a lot of the technical adoptions that maybe need to be done that are outside of the norm don't get adopted and, and it results in lost time for the operator. Do you have any other points you want to No, show? that's it for me. So my name is Mike Broderick, and uh, I'm an extended reach drilling engineer. You may have surmised that. And um, I guess, you know, when I was coming back to uh, taking responsibility for the engineering of your well, I think it's a really big thing here that I've seen. Where now we're getting uh, one page drilling programs uh, that are cut and pasted. I've even seen a few where they neglected to change the footer or the with the well name on the program. You know, that's how fast these things are getting thrown out there. And I'm seeing more and more people rely on results from other operators. It's very easy for an engineer to say, okay, Slumberjay, I want you to run the torque and drag. I want you to run all the hydraulics. And then I want you to tell me what I'm going to have. And then he gets that, that information back, plugs it into the program, throws it over the fence to the guys in the field. And there you have it. Done deal. And I'm also seeing where the drilling supervisors are the guys that are really running the operation. It's not really the drilling engineer. It's really the guy out there saying, no, what you need to do is this. And the drilling engineer is saying, oh, okay, yeah, oh, man, that's a good idea. So if you're going into a project or you're coming into something new, especially, I think it's extremely important that you take responsibility for your own engineering, then give it to them and say, okay, I want you to go over these numbers and then collaborate. Say, okay, this doesn't really look right. Why is this? How did you come up with this number? Okay, especially in the rotary steerable game, because there's a lot of variables that you need to take into account. <coughs> Not in the complex wells, uh, take PWD, for instance. Um, when you get into uh, very complex BHAs that have a whole lot of tools, one of the big surprises is that you may be waiting two to three minutes on that PWD information to go through the queue. So if I'm standing there at the surface and I see a 12.3, and I'm thinking, oh, well, I'm just fine. And then three minutes later, all of a sudden, I'm at a 12.8. I go, oh, man, what's going on here? How is that information being transmitted to you in the queue? And that's one of the things that kind of gets missed, especially when you start adding uh, all the geo steering toys that you can get into now. Um, some of the, the sonic for your cement and all this, all these different things. It all depends on how all that's set up. And you want to know when you, before you get that tool on the ground, you want to know how your information is, is going to be coming to the surface to see. Um, another thing that I'm seeing is what they provide you at the first, and you do all this, this 
major engineering and take the major time to go into dig into this pha and get it just perfect turns out you have a failure well then you go to pick up that backup and it's different and you're going oh, now wait a minute <laughs> and oftentimes this gets hidden you know oh, okay just go ahead and pick up the backup but you go in there and you pick up that backup and unless any somebody really looks at it carefully you come to find out that, hey, now I've got 90 degree wrap stabilizers instead of 45 degree wrap stabilizers, or um, I have a, a, a sleeve tight centralizer or stabilizer, or you know whatever that is, you have to make sure that that backup is uh, exactly what you engineered as well. And if there are changes to it, you want to see what the BHA modeling results are for that specific BHA. Unless you're running exactly the same BHA on both your primary and your backup, you want to get that information in of what the, that BHA is going to do at your various parameters. So um, another thing that I see, and I'm sure Chris sees quite often, is everybody's been to the K&M school or the Merlin school, or you know, everybody knows you need to rotate, you need to switch plate. So <clears throat> I'm sure what one of the big things Chris sees and I see is people like to cherry pick those things. They'll say, you know, we're going to rotate at 120, but our six RPM is going to be, we don't really like it that high. We're going to keep that instead of one time or 1.1 times the whole size, we'll keep it three quarter. I think it'd be okay. Or um, uh, penetration rate, just like you were saying, I, I love the, the, the comment about, oh, we're going to slow down for the last thousand feet of the hole. And then we'll be a head on hole cleaning and we'll just go ahead and come out the ground. Well, that doesn't always work that way, does it? Who, how does your hole fill up? Anybody know? Where is it, where does it, how does it, how does it, how does it fill up? All at once, from the top, from the bottom, how does it fill up? 60 to 30 degrees. One well, in high angle, it's going to fill up from the bottom of the, of the hole, right? It goes over your BHA where there's less angular velocity. Then it's going to start filling up, and this is where it's going to be all about managing that cutting bed height. How good is my hole cleaning? Well, it's going to be how high that overall cutting bed is, right? Just like you were saying. If you outgrow yourself and that cutting's bed is too high, you're never going to be able to get out of the ground. <laughs> right. So even though at the last thousand feet you're coming off that ROP, all that is still sitting there, isn't it? Now you may have reduced it a little bit, but it's still nowhere near acceptable for tripping. It's fine for drilling. It's probably not going to be okay for drilling. It's certainly not going to be small enough for a casing run is it so people have to really realize that you know i i talk to a lot of people that can't picture how that hole fills and cleans from the bottom up and this is exactly why you'll see that you can sit there and circulate for a day and you'd pull 30 stands and all of a sudden you run into something else and say oh man the hole's falling apart or whatever it is but no you just didn't circulate long enough so um, there, there are a lot of, there is the cherry picking thing going on of, well, we think we can do this and uh, we can save some money doing this, even all the way down to the torque and drag numbers. Now it's, ah, we'll do that every five stands or we'll do it every 10 stands. It seems to get longer and longer and longer. And, oh, we'll do it with the pumps on, which makes no sense whatsoever. Torque and drag in that one indicator, the primary indicator of your hole conditions, your real time hole conditions is getting pushed further and further and further back. The PWD, can it see what's below it? No. Is that your number one tool for hole cleaning? No. Torque and drag, yes, it's one thing that's going to tell you what's going on, even all the way down to differential sticking. You uh, saw uh, what Chris was talking about. Um, 
you can tell before you get differentially stuck. And that's when you can look at the torque, you can say, okay, after a connection, how much is it taking to break that pipe and get it rotating? If that number keeps increasing on you, you know you're getting into something, don't you? So these numbers are extremely important, especially if you get into a new area. And if you don't really pay attention to those numbers and do it, not you know, try to cut corners with it and, and save money with the one tool that gives you your whole, your real time hole conditions, then you're really shooting yourself in the foot. So I see that a lot. So, uh, you know, when I look at, at motors, it's a whole nother ball game, but they're also going to give you a slightly oversized hole, aren't they? Because of that bend in the motor. So what people will find is that they can get those motors, those motors out of the ground a heck of a lot easier than they can a rotary steerable. And when you plant one, one another thing that I'm seeing is nobody's really digging into the, the root cause of why that thing got stuck. Oftentimes it comes from the, the field, ah, it was differential sticking. Ah, it may have been something from the shoe or something like that, but nobody's getting in there and really digging in and finding out what got you stuck. And do you really need to use the rotary steerable? Do you have to, is this thing hurting you or helping you with that gauge hole? And if you think back to the GeoPilot, I don't know if anybody had any experience with the GeoPilot, it had virtually zero bypass area. And I can't tell you how many of those things got planted around the world when they first came out. They, they made great progress now in expanding that uh, overall uh, bypass area and gotten a lot better, but at the beginning, I mean, you, you couldn't get them out of the ground. So now you are gonna run into a lot of uh, problems with tool replacements because of a lot of these supply lines that are being shut down or in, in a bit of a bind due to the whole COVID thing and all that. So um, you really have to do your due, due diligence. Get those engineers to really do their due, due diligence and get in there and really engineer the well. Don't just leave it to somebody else to uh, engineer for you. And that's about it. That was a good segue to our next thing. <laughs> Sure. For Mike or for Chris, uh, <coughs> talks about trends. You know, we know that we're seeing increased rotor steerable use over conventional. What about in, in curves? Are you seeing um, a trend that more operators are doing curves with rotor steerables, or is it kind of not a trend? Well, you know, you, the room? well, you know, what's what, what's interesting is if you. Um, like the stuff I'm doing now, we're looking at 45 to 50,000 feet. And if you mess up that curve and create a lot of dog legs and tortuosity within that curve, you're dead by the time you get to the end. So in a lot of cases, it comes down to what's my torque and drag looking like at the end of my section? And am I close to any limitations or anything like that? And then say, okay, well, gosh, I really can't afford to have any tortuosity up here in my build because I know it's going to take me to my uh, makeup torque of the drill pipe at the end of the section, or maybe my top drive is not going to give me 120 RPMs or 150 RPMs. So at the end of the day, it's, you have to come back and say, how smooth do I really need to make this build, right? And how much experience do I have with motors? Because hey, just because you, you get in there and, and you say, okay, I'm going to go to a rotary steerable, does that guy really know how much force to use to, to run that rotary steerable? I, I've seen some real train wrecks with the guy out there with the rotary steerable putting in all these wild dog legs because he doesn't have a good handle on what force to use um, to guide that RSS. So really it comes back to how smooth does that curve need to be and how much experience do I have drilling the curve with the, with the motors? And do I really want to go to something completely new when I've been having success in the past and I have a good feel for uh, that curve and what sort of dog leg I'm going to get out of it? So, I mean, I'm not asking for about 45,000 foot long, like 18 to 22,000 foot long Permian Basin. Are you seeing operators um, 
up water is terrible for the other curve and more frequent for the other. Yeah, because you can get it all in one shot. That's, yeah, that's, that's, that's the key thing. It's not just a speaking on it. I can do it in one run and be in and be in and out. Where right. Trips cost me that. You basically draw him for the weight from that. And Fred Cobb, you know, if Fred Cobb is 50 to 150,000 dollars, that's a big chunk. Or even on a 10 day well, one day that extra trip time in there adds up. So, yeah, you, you see it more. See, my, my experience, it depends on where you're at, you see it more and more, but it also ties back in if you're talking even, even an 18,000 or 20,000 foot well. What you do at the first part impact what you do in that. One of the reasons we looked at at Southwestern, we looked at an air rotary steerable option was because we were seeing some impact in the upper part of the air section of what they were doing, the dog legs. And we saw when, when you know, torque and drag numbers started showing a little bit higher. So we were looking at some alternatives to keep that smoother and, some, and, not, and not penalize ourselves with our So that, that, that was why we looked at that. To answer your question, from an operator standpoint, we were about 50 50. I, I, I had a personal term. I liked more rotary steerable than I did conventional because you get it cut because you change because you, you, you again the guys rolling with steerable conventional have a different mindset. The guys with rotary steerable with what you know, just begin. I'm looking at as an operator two different mechanisms and how you set yourself up in the upper part of the curve. Tells you what you can do in the bottom part. I prefer going with a rotor steerable sooner rather than later because I can get ahead of the game and smooth it out. Whereas a lot of times with steerable, if I, I did, they didn't do as good a job with the guys who were going to get me lined up and I'm playing, I'm playing catch up. And that impacted me not so much on the drilling, but again, impacted me on how to run cases. That, that was that was my focus. I, I would say 90% of the problems that I had on, on that one were not the drilling, it was running case. That, that cost me more time, more problems, more, and my company cost us more major issues there. Okay. It, it also so depends. On your, on, for your assignment, well, specifically into your shallow direction. When you're doing your budgets, that's where you need to have your best direction drill because your, your port is going to be subject to whatever dog legs and whatever tension you have across those dog So if you've got a Two or three degree dog leg at a thousand foot, and you're going at 10, 12,000 feet, that's going to make your torque longer. It's going to have to drill the power or get the rotation of the piece. So, making sure that you try to drive those nudges as deep as possible because your dog leg is only as bad as from a torque standpoint as the tension across it. So, the shallower it is, the more tension you have across it, the more it's going to be limited. And also, with it comes back to hole cleaning as well. If you have a 1.5 degree bend in your motor, you're not going to rotate that thing very fast and you obviously you aren't going to be able to clean your hole once you get above you know 30 degrees 40 degrees, whatever it is right so you aren't going to be able to rotate that, that thing so now if you can draw your curve and drill the whole lateral and have the the luxury of being able to clean your hole the whole time you're in great shape you know but now you know what we're seeing a lot of now is is now it's getting into turns isn't it to where can I get, you know, we're looking at paper clip wells, we're looking at J wells, we're looking at things like that, that now you're gonna need a 10 to a 14 degree dog leg to be able to come around and get, you know, safe space on your pads. So now in some cases, you know, you've heard of the archery, you've heard of these rotary steerables that can put out these outrageous dog legs. But what we're finding is in some cases, you just can't get that dog leg. Or you don't want that dog leg because it, Again, it doesn't matter how good well I how well I do. It's can it be completed and can I get plugs? Well, this is actually what they're trying to do is kind of, is drill you know a couple miles out and then come back in. Oh no, I'm talking about, I'm talking about your dog leg. Your dog leg's ability. Right. That's that's the key piece. It's I we did we looked at that. So it's not it's it's the kind of world where you leave in architecture. You leave if, right if it, if it's if it, you know in a chalk well you the old time like, you could get away with an 18 or 20 degree dog leg because you were trying to put two and seven eighths tube in an eight and a half hole. When you're trying to put a five and a half in, a 15 degree dog leg may impact how it's completed 
and that's a key piece to consider is is how do you design it to to be able to be effectively completed and because the completions folks have a lot more issues one because they can't rotate that they're working off a of coil tubing or they're working off a of stick pipe I mean, we are that's 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 if there's a benefit we have on our side that's a that's a key benefit working inside a casing or working trying to pump plugs down or do that kind of stuff or work with cool tubing there's a lot more limits there and as we as on the drilling side have to consider that when we drill the well well the so in 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 this case um what i was referring to is is somebody's actually planning for this big turn to come back around and these are these these require 12 degree dog legs 14 degree dog legs and what's happening is we're not getting that that kind of a turn so then we have to go in with the motor okay now for that turn you need a four and three quarter rss Okay, so right off the bat, you're going to, you're starting to look at reliability because we know as you get smaller in those sizes, reliability starts getting, hmm, you know, if I have a six and three quarter tool versus a four and three quarter, I can start saying that maybe I am going to have a tool failure with this four and three quarter. But when I go in there with a motor, I'm not going to have a four and three quarter motor. I'm going to have to have a larger motor and I'm going to have to drill a larger hole. So what happens is you get into this six inch style trying to make this turn, but when you go in and have to correct with the motor, you're gonna to have to do it in something bigger. So you really don't wanna get into a four and three quarter motor and that sort of a thing, because oftentimes the pressure drop will kill you. And now you're running one or two agitators, which are about 600 a piece on the pressure drop. So it yeah, so it, it does. <laughs> Exactly right. Yeah, Michael, we're going to share your thoughts and talk a lot about utilizing rotary tools, especially in the lateral. We've seen an increase of eccentric string reamers being run to help modern challenges. Hmm, that's a good one. So, well, if you, so what, one of the things that it comes to, if, if I'm going to run a string reamer, oftentimes it comes back to, do I have a lot of, uh, am I in a laminated formation? So if I have where I'm going from, you know, uh, claystone into a hard sandstone and then back into a claystone, um, I may want to go ahead and, and, and smooth these guys out. Um, I've seen that uh, be beneficial. Uh, but I've also seen it be a hindrance. So one, one of the things that I don't like is putting a Band-Aid on something where you haven't come back to the root cause of the problem. So in a lot of cases, what you'll see is people, when they get on a hard street, they'll really push on that thing. And what they'll do is they'll create quite a micro dog leg right there. Then they'll have to adjust for it. And really what winds up happening to you when you're coming out of the hole, now you, it takes very little bit of, of debris to get you wedged at that dang heart street. So a lot of it comes back to how do I want to drill that heart street as well? And very few people really think about that. I don't want to really stomp down on that weight and create that micro dog leg in there to create me problems for your completion or getting down the hole or even going back in. So um, I, I like them. I, I also see we're, we're going to run some up where I am uh, to see how, how much um, tool life we can save or stabilizer life because we'll run that at the top of the BHA and then we'll, we're going to have to back frame our entire uh, 28, 30,000 foot 17 and a half inch hole section. So we want to have that to try and protect some of our tools from overall wear. And I think that might help. But if you're throwing it in just for back ring, being able to back ring, uh, for getting stuck purposes. I think the idea is to follow your, if in your rotary circle, uh, since they rotate and the eccentric ring will create the formation of maybe eight inch over your cut size. Also, uh, you know, 
That cutting's bit is still going to be created behind that guy. <laughs> so, but yeah, you know, I think the the jury's still out. I, I think all these tools have their own applications. But again, it comes back to don't just throw them in as a band aid because you perceive a certain problem. Engineer that problem. That's the whole thing. Go back to the engineering of it. How's it going to help me? How's it going to hurt me? What exactly am I putting in the ground? I understand. Oh, absolutely. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. We had a, a couple of uh, folks come up with the um, talking about the uh, big problems being the availability of tools. I invited uh, Nick Leonard with uh, Schuler Blackman to uh, come in. Uh, I'll let him explain a little bit about what Schuler Blackman does and the perspective that uh, that they have. So we'll take just a couple minutes with that. So thanks, Nick, for coming. Yeah. How do I uh, insert the Jim, do you want me to insert presentation? Oh, you have a presentation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, can you use that since you're using a Mac? I can. I will have to find it. Yeah, I gotta get my mouse over there. All right, anybody see my mouse again? It's up there. Okay, there we go. The SPS manufacturing colors. Yep, that's it. That's it. There you go. All right. I'm going to go side to side here. It's just the arrows. Oh, yeah, you can do that. You just, uh, just click. Oh, I'm going to have to get this shared now, too. I go side to side here. Let's see if I just do it this way. There it is. I got it. Yeah. Cheers. Okay. Good morning. Um, a little bit of a sidestep. Not yet, is it? <laughs> it is by two minutes. Good afternoon. I'm Nick Leonard with Shell Buckman. Uh, along with me is Carl Eisenkobler, Engineering Director. Uh, sidestepping a little bit, we're higher up on the uh, on the scale when it comes to drilling. We're going to be talking just briefly about what Shell Buckman does. Shell Buckman oil field technology, machining the collars, the LWD, MWD collars that are associated with some of these bits that you guys are looking at and discussing today. Of course. Okay, good. It's working now. This is a fun one. I'll just do it this way. It's easier this way. So, um, you know, the industry itself is very esoteric. And so one of the reasons why I thank Jim for inviting us here this afternoon is to give a little bit better scope on what it takes to machine these parts. Uh, Chris, in his first presentation, talked about the increasing cost 
And part of that is indirectly uh, what we're seeing as well when we see these designs. We're designing these parts per the prints of all the service companies, Schlumberger, Halliburton, Baker, Weatherford, some of the small tier companies as well. We are responsible for probably 65% of the callers that are out there right now. So we're number one when it comes to machining these parts. The reason for that is because you've got to be vertically integrated in machining this for the best cost efficiencies. So the first part of that is material. Shell Blackman has its own proprietary material grades, which are designed, all 12 of them, for different applications and environments, everything from corrosion resistance to higher mechanical properties. From that standpoint, you move into the cold forging, which is where you're going to apply the mechanical properties to these non-mag alloys. And we're talking non-mag specifically, because that's what these that's what these uh, these collars are pr produced out of. Yes, you can use 718 and some higher alloyed nickel alloys, but you're going to pay through the roof for them. It's sometimes uh, overkill for some of the applications that you're looking for. So within Shell Buckman in Austria, Shell Buckman Oilfield Technology, we have our cold forge, which is applying mechanical properties to the alloys. That's the first step. Our second step comes into straightening of these bars, the peeling of the bars, and ID honing of the bars. CNC boring, gun drilling, CNC turning, CNC milling and turning milling combination machines. What is CNC? Control. Uh, said control. Anything else? CNC stands for control, computerized, Carl. Everything that you see here that we have within Shell Blackman has been procured over years, over decades. Tools that were costing approximately $15,000 per collar now cost roughly 45 on average. As Chris mentioned, everything is becoming more innovative. And with innovation, you have technology. This technology is expensive. The only way we've been able to offset some of the expenses is to vertically integrate everything within our facility. That includes all of the machinery that you see here that is producing these collars, everything from laser cladding, high energy peening, peening is surface treatment, shop peening, hammer ID on the ID. This is a summary of what we do here at SBOT. It's from end to end core, from the material to the end product by design from Schlumberger, Halliburton, and all the other major companies. And what we wanted to basically uh, give you guys a little bit of an idea on is that when we see the innovation come through through design, we help that design process with, these, with our customers and help them understand that certain designs that they think are going to be just packed with information, we come in and allow them to understand, look, the design is great, but it's going to cost you $250,000. So that's not going to sell on the market. And so through these combinations, we allow them uh, through our design for our engineering design expertise, allow them to kind of tone down what they're trying to do. But what we've seen through the years is we've seen these collars nonetheless go from very long, 29 feet down to 17 feet. But as they shrink these collars down, they become much more complicated. And what we do from our side is just the machining aspect of this. So we're just machining the collar itself. This has nothing to do with all the intricate, all the intricate designs that go into the PCB boards, everything from the chassis that completes the collar assembly itself. And so, you know, Chris, you talked about earlier, years down the road, where all of this is going we see the evolution becoming more and more advanced. We're trying to stay with that advancement by innovating ourselves through what we see through these designs. 
I think at some point we're going to see less of an evolution, more of a revolution that comes through. And that revolutionary change, I couldn't tell you where that is or what it's going to look like. Um, but it will start to change the industry as a whole because of how we've come far so quickly in just the last 10 years, just the last five years of what we've seen in developments in these designs for these collars. And so really what we wanted to do was just kind of give you a brief idea of what we do at Shell Blackman Oilfield Technology for some of the collars that are associated with everything that everyone talks about more on the supply chain side itself, these are intricate pieces that fill up the entire RSS. Yeah, yeah that was the end of the presentation there. So, so what are your like temperature specs? Or is it as much as you can pay for? Or, because I think we're kind of at a limit now, about 350 degrees Fahrenheit. And we keep seeing more and more requirements for people wanting to use tools and hotter temperatures. Do you, do you all, are you getting a lot of that requirement? And do you know what, kind of what y'all are got the limit based on the business? in terms of in terms of temperature, I can't tell you if it's temperature, but I can tell you that it is in terms of corrosion resistance. Okay. There have been a lot, there's been more movement from less alloyed material where you have <laughs> yield strengths of 110. People want to see now 140, maybe more. They want to see more corrosion resistant alloys um, because you're running so hard, so fast. And then the environments themselves are not easy on these materials. They're tearing them up quite well. We're seeing that where we had our, our bread and butter alloys, we're seeing a shift now to higher alloy, but not quite the Inconel, not the 718 varieties because those price levels for those alloys and that material is just through the roof. And it's also too volatile. Nickel-based alloys are 50% nickel, basically. And you're riding with the nickel prices. Whereas the alloys that we have that we manufacture in-house, the proprietary alloys that we have, we've gone more on the chrome and magnes side of things. So to answer your question, yes, things are moving more towards corrosion resistance, which is more nickel not quite the nickel base, but we're seeing that shift in the past two years alone, very aggressively in that area. I think that's the same temperature. Um, yeah, the car industry being impacted by, by issues on microcircuitry and how is that affected like uh, vendors and stuff like that that use microcircuitry or you need to get that access to get their systems to do their system both down home and circuits? So I asked that question because uh, semiconductors are a problem right now for everybody. And so obviously that would also be an issue. What was the question? The semiconductors. Point, semiconductors. There's a shortage of semiconductors, microchips basically. And is that having an effect on the supply chain? because all of those electronics are inserted into these collars. In short, the answer is yes. We are seeing an impact, but not a major huge impact as it would be more on the retail side, like your example for the automotive. Y'all be able to recycle the problem. They melt down and reuse them? No. So you have to start from scratch. We start from scratch. How much more stuff? You know, in Lafayette, I can't answer that question. I don't think the individual sites are not going to hold a tremendous amount of stock. Most of the raw material stock is going to be in Austria, where the, where the material is actually produced anyway, where we have 430,000 square, square feet of space, over 140 uh, CNC machines. All the, all the space required is utilized to stock 75, 80 pieces of material. Certain diameters that we see are in higher demand than others is really what we're gonna focus on. So it's more of a safety stock than anything else. But the business itself has always been reliant on being indent business, basically from the beginning to the end, obtaining the material and then running it all the way through because it's the best way you're gonna find the efficiencies for, for cost. 
see a shortage coming. In regards to what? We see shortage, no. Lead times, yes. Shortage would indicate that it's not, shortage would indicate we can't get the amount that we're looking for. We can get the amount that we're looking for, but we're seeing lead times extend because the, the supplier that we utilize for raw material for the alloys, they're seeing, they're being hit with nickel, stainless, 17 4, 41, 4. They're being hit with everything right now. And this has been the bullwhip effect from COVID. Now everyone is, is, is basically waking up and is trying to capture as much business as they can. So it's affecting us and everyone else. So there's a lead time. There's an extension of lead time, yes, but we're still together. That's why the safety stock is so important for us. And this transcends actually to the products for Schlumberger, Halliburton, Baker, which then delays everything else down the road. There's a question in the back. Any other questions? With the salads coming out, that usually kills a lot of the uh, questions you know, that come into play. So great. Thanks, Nick. I'll get that back. I want to on one second. All right, thanks. All right, for our last session, um, we're going to bring in uh, Kyle Ritter. I'll let you come around here to the camera. And then we have online also Paul Neal. Uh, you know, this session is really uh, how can we make uh, more informed decisions? Uh, Kyle is with DTEC, a rotary steerable provider, and Paul is with NOV, who has motors and rotary steerables. So they're just going to give some perspective, perspective in terms of um, how, how are the uh, drivers, what, what is it that they're looking for uh, when they're doing a the job to get it uh, set up successfully. So Kyle, I'll let you give yourself a little background and we'll let Neil or Paul uh, say that. Sure. Uh, I'm Kyle Ritter with DTEC, I'm the operations manager. Uh, I've been with uh, DTEC coming on seven years now. So I've seen Quite a significant shift in the rotary steerable market um, since we went commercial in 2014. So it's, uh, it's that's my background with DTEC. Before that, um, directional drilling uh, operations with Baker Hughes, a lot of rotary steerable. Uh, what you probably have to do is uh, you have to Paul, go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, uh, 
Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for uh, allowing me the opportunity to talk. So my name is Paul Neal, um, 21 years in the industry. First 10 years have been on the service side of the company, predominantly in um, uh, MLWD technology, rotary steerable technology. And then uh, the last 11 years I've been with NOV um, uh, on the manufacturing side of the business. Uh, again, heavily involved with the rotary steerable uh, technologies here and, and now um, supporting uh, some of the motor technologies here. I'm, I basically support our applications engineering team, our quality teams, and, and heavily involved with new product, new product uh, integration. So thanks for having me. Sure. I'm actually going to go back and reference some of the stuff uh, Mike brought up. You know, some of the things we struggle with a lot of the times is uh, a plug and play, a silver bullet, you know, pick up a rotary steerable, solve all your problems, um, you know, just throwing it over the fence to the, the operations team in the field and, you know, trying to make it work. Um, and DTEC has, has pushed pretty hard recently to be much more integrated in the entire process and, you know, taking lessons learned and, and trying to integrate a lot of that into the next project. Uh, un unfortunately, you know, you, you run across issues where, you know, things will change uh, quickly, you know, uh, you know, we'll plan for, you know, an MWD below motor, which is a very common BHA practice right now. And last minute, you know, losses or, you know, other factors will come aboard where now there's a concern about losing an MWD tool and a rotary steerable tool. So we'll move the MWD above and stabilization placement then changes drastically and that'll affect how a rotary steerable will, you know, will steer, how easy it will track. Um, so then we're changing parameters and, and dealing with a customer that, that wants higher ROPs or certain specific performance changes from um, you know, dog legs or yield capability. And, and that all changes as you, you move uh, stabilization points around. So the pre-job planning and, and the discussion of getting that not only from the engineer to the superintendents, to the company men, to the directional drillers and everybody down to the driller of what we're going to do and how we're going to do it is, is a significant challenge um, right now. Um, so from the rotary steerable side, I mean, there's a lot of good points brought up today, you know, loss, loss and hold. Um, I think we, uh, at DTEC, we haven't lost a tool since 2019. Uh, we've done, a, a, I know I have to jinx myself, but you know, and it's, we take, we take, we take a lot of, yeah. but I, I mean, so, but we do also have the loss, the lowest loss and hold costs uh, for a rotary steerable tool. I mean, you're, you're talking $2 million for a rotary steerable when we're, we're a 10th of that um, takes a lot of the risk out of, of running a rotary steerable and, and opens up the discussions of, of trying different things, trying different stabilizations. Uh, you know, being a smaller company, we're, we're able to kind of, and being a very modular and, and newer rotary steerable design specifically for a, a US land application has allowed us to be a bit more uh, risk friendly. You know, very risk adverse market right now. Yeah, no, I I agree with you on that. I mean, I think that um, a lot of the pre-job discussions are critical in deciding what the best approach is, right? I mean, um, you know, we look at um, if you look at the vertical section versus the curved section versus the lateral section. What exactly are you trying to accomplish and what's the right tool for the job? And I think you mentioned that there's no silver bullet as such, right? You know, in, in the vertical sections, how much tortuosity can you tolerate in the vertical section so that it doesn't impact you from a torque and drag standpoint in your lateral section, right? Um, is it critical to have rotary stubble there or not? Um, in the curved sections, you know, when you look at, you know, what dog legs are you looking to accomplish? Why do they have to be those? Uh, you know, do you need an 8, do you need a 10? What's, what's the driving force behind it? Um, in, in those sections, what, I guess, direction are you drilling? How much formation push are you going to get? Um, you know, all these different things are going to impact on which solution is the right solution. And, you know, there's quite a bit of discussion on the lateral sections and getting cuttings out of the hole. And I believe it was 
uh, I'm not sure if it was Chris or uh, someone had mentioned, you know, um, pulling back and seeing less uh, motor assist applications to get more rotation um, and, you know, introducing new technology. And I, I think Dickie had mentioned that, you know, he said uh, there was a comment about um, rotary steer bowls allowed them to think about how they drill wells differently, right? And I mean, at NOV, you know, we, we are a provider of, of a bunch of different technologies. We talked about motors, we talked about rotary steerable. Uh, we talked about agitators uh, earlier and, and using two agitators and things like that. Um, and we're developing technology now that allows you to actually change the bend of the motor while you're downhole. So you can have a motor that's straight and then you can shift it and it goes back to bent if you're looking to do a vertical curve, curved lateral, or if you're in the lateral and, and you need to make an adjustment, you put it in the bend setting, you make your adjustment, you put it back straight to get the rotations that you need. So, I mean, I think during the planning stage, it's absolutely critical that we understand exactly what we're trying to accomplish and, and what the end goals are. Um, because if you look at, you know, limitations that are kind of outside our scope, right? If there's hydraulics limitations, if you need 600 PSI for an agitator, 650 PSI for a rotary steerable to get the pressure you need for the pads to activate or whatever the situation is, it's all these little things that can, can impact performance on the technology and, and impact if you're able to be successful in running whichever tool you decide to run. Sorry, I keep moving this thing back and forth, but um, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it, I mean, I spent a lot of time drilling wells as a directional driller with a motor and that's a majority of what, you know, the people we're training and working with tend to have their experience with. And as referenced earlier, there is a different mindset for running a rotary steerable tool. Um, you know, as a directional driller, you're trying to rotate as much, slide as little as possible. And, you know, when you're running a rotor steerable tool, you want to make smaller corrections more often and keep those stock leaks down. And, you know, the, the mindset, getting that changed. Um, I, I will say, I still haven't seen it. It's probably out there now, but you're always going to be able to drill a curve faster with the motor than a rotor steerable tool. You know, we're, rotor steerable tool isn't the answer for everything, and it's not the perfect application for everything. Yeah. But the risk of or the benefits of being faster aren't necessarily great for being able to reduce torque down at the end of the ladder. Yeah. So you know, a top-down view of what is your objective of running the rotary steerable tool? If it's purely time savings, you know, where are you going to save that time? You're not necessarily always going to save it on the drilling side. It's going to be how easy can you get out of the hole? Um, you know, how easy is it to get your casing to bottom? Mm -hmm. You know, we're not always you know, we're, we're still rotating. We're, you know, we're going to save you time when you're sliding, but there's still added benefit to a rotary steerable system when, when you may not necessarily have a sliding issue. You may have just getting casing the bottom or trying to make your completions better. Yeah. So as Lake Dickey said, it's the hole you keep, not the hole you drill, right? right. Too much going on here. Sorry. Yeah, I was saying, uh, I think. Um, one, one second. Yeah. What, what sort of problems are you seeing with uh, the addition of a mod? Um, as it was also referenced earlier, the, the, the biggest issue of adding a motor, I mean, it's not so much for the steering or any kind of, of drilling dynamic, it's the coming off of bottom or going back to bottom. Um, you know, we're usually running the MWD below the motor, um, so you're putting a lot of, you know, I, would, I don't want to say fragile, but you're, you're making the BHA more fragile. You know, you're, you're adding, you know, jewelry down below between the bit and the motor uh, where it used to be a bit. It's a lot easier to just, you know, you get the stand down, you yank her off bottom, you kill your rotary. Um, the vibrations, the stick slip, the, 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 the torsional event that's created has much less effect on the BHA at that point. Whereas now we're seeing, you know, the, the practices that of coming off bottom are much more important when you're running a rotary steerable tool compared to a motor. So our biggest issue with running any kind of modular motor or running a motor is, is um, the stress it adds to the BHA over time, especially in vertical applications. Um, you know, it's people want to go faster. They want to smash on it and push. And, you know, as you're going through different formations, you know, changing that BHA and where the stabilization points are, um, are going to be very important. And, you know, 
very, very much do we hear, I, I don't want to run stabilizers. They, they're not going to help me, but they're very important when you're running in certain applications. And it's a discussion that, that needs to be had. Yeah, I agree with you on that. There's, you know, it's um, a situation where um, ensuring that we've got the right motor in this trend first and foremost, but I, I, there's not much I can really add to that, man. I'm going to break this thing. I know it. I just feel it. <laughs> uh, you are going to break it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so, so for us, um, I mean, some of the other topics that were brought up, like the loss and hold, um, you know, we, we find the BHA, the communication is, is really the key to, to keeping items, you know, things like that happening. Um, we found, you know, on our side of things, we're having to become much more involved in the, the daily activities that are going on. It's not, you know, we're, we're not able to just hand a customer a rotary steerable and be like, hey, here you go, we're done. Call us when you need to pick up off location or when you're gonna drop it off and we'll get some memory data back to you and let you know what happened. Um, you know, we've had to institute a remote operation center that keeps an eye on things, sharing of data. Uh, I think, we struggle with it's a lot of us versus them, motors versus rotary steerable, you know, rotary steerable versus rotary steerable. Um, where DTEC is much more of the mindset, you know, the more work our competitors get, the, the greater the market gets and the more it opens up for us. So things are, you know, for us, I, I, I want to see more rotary steerable runs, even if it may not be DTEC getting it. If we get more runs, you know, it's more data, it's more learning, it's people becoming more comfortable with the technology. Um, so we're, we're much more involved in seeing it grow, being involved day to day. So, you know, we can advise our customers like, hey, we're seeing an event, you know, your driller, no one ever wants to hear this, but, you know, your driller is making some poor decisions, you know, you know, here's why, present some data and try and prevent incidences down the road. Um, you know, it helps them as well, you know, MWD damage or any other kind of callers are becoming more more rare, <laughs> you know, it's, it's tougher to get them in, in reasonable times, you know, damage to our equipment, uh, you know, that we struggle with you know, something getting damaged due to bad drilling practices is, is you know, something we want to avoid. You know, we've, DTEC is always, well, you know, and thankfully uh, our, our, our parent company is Scholler Blackman. So we, we, we do get some, some benefits as far as, uh, you know, we have a great source to be able to get materials and, you know, but we, unfortunately we don't get to jump the line. Uh, so <laughs> these times are still an issue. Um, so, you know, we, yeah, so we, we still have to, um, you know, we, for us, it's beneficial. Like I don't want to come and, you know, have a, a bigger ticket and, you know, have damages. It's, it's much easier for me to go to a customer and say, Hey, let's, let's work towards a solution of, you know, best practices, even though they may not be the fastest, I, I am going to save you time and money at the end. <clears throat> cool, and you're going to spend less money on broken equipment. Do you find that operators are open to that? Some, not everyone. Um, you know, it was once again referenced earlier when, when there's much more of a, uh, you know, everybody's communicating with each other. Your, your engineers talking to your superintendents, talking to your company men, to your directional drillers. The message is, is trans transferred down the line better and you're, you're drilling you know, your, your uh, prog meetings, your, your pre-spud meetings, um, you know, we're invited to less and less. We see, you know, we're not, we're not part of those discussions as much as I think we were. We try and be more now, but um, you know, some, some operators, it's much more prevalent than others. Yeah. So, uh I, I completely agree with that. And, and that's some of the challenge I think that, um, on our end, we, we see as well, it's the more integrated we become with the, the, the company men on location or the directional drillers or the, or the drilling engineer, uh, the more successful we typically are. And it's very operator dependent on, on how the dynamic looks. Some it's, it's top down, some, uh, some just allow the, the company representative to run as is. So for us to understand exactly what that dynamic looks like, um, it gives us a better opportunity to uh, set the technology up as needed, set the well up uh, 
and understand the hydraulics and, and what the limitations are on the rig. And then um, once it comes time to execution, you know, we talk about remote centers and, and watching it remotely and having guys in location to support and all those different things really help us to become more successful in getting the wells drilled. Um, not always, but I think that sometimes there's just a mentality of, you know, as you mentioned, um, just get the tool out there and we'll run it. It doesn't work that way. It's, it's a different mindset. And, I mean, and technologies change, uh, you know, equipment evolves, um, you know, GeoPilot, you know, was referenced earlier as well. I mean, the point to bit systems aren't nearly as prevalent as the push to bit systems are now. So um, we still struggle talking to engineers or any individuals that have run rotary steerable and one bad experience with a specific rotary steerable tool, um, you know, can, can sour them to the, the mindset of rotary steerable tools. And, and I mean, I'd love to say that DTEC has, has never done that, but of, of course, I mean, everybody has a bad experience at some point. So, um, you know, the, the push is to constantly innovate, constantly change and, and try and, you know, be ahead of those incidents and manage them when they come across and you know, try, try and stay open to, to communication you know, as things change and things get better. <laughs> oh, it, like I said, everything has a, an application. And, and it, what I'm seeing today, and I'm going to ask you that you're seeing it too, is you have to get a high frequency force oscillation, which is the only reserve system. Um, it, it's it's hard for us to to get all the data to be able to say you know unfortunately we are a small piece of the puzzle um, we don't always get um, the the end data uh, I just had a, a recent run where you know come to find out you know the engineers run us before and you know a vertical application and it's the fastest vertical they ever had we didn't do a vertical application. Why not? Uh, you know, why didn't we know that? So we don't get a lot of data, uh, unfortunately. Sometimes we do. It depends on, on where it is. Our, our biggest thing right now is, is drilling practices. Um, I, I struggle with, with the best practices and, and the, way, um, you know, the way drillers were 10 years ago to today. It, it seems like there's a lot of gap in the education. Coming to bottom, coming up bottom, stalls, how to manage those situations. Uh, we're, we're much more of a, not an over the time, you know, breakdown or, or, or damage or you know, high frequency, you know. Uh, we struggle with more spontaneous incidents, you know, coming to bottom, you know, forgetting, you know, rotary or coming off bottom is usually our biggest thing, you know, they not noticing, you know, the, the drillers are setting it and forgetting it. You know, set the set it, and then they're on their phones. They're on TikTok. And we struggle with that, you know. And it's, you know, they're they're on bottom. They're they're stalled out, and you know, it's two minutes before anybody notices. Those, I've had more incidents like that lately than I have, you know, where I see cracking or wear and tear. It's spontaneous incidents that are our biggest struggle right now. Harold, Paul, you want to chime in? I, I didn't quite hear the question actually. Oh, uh, so the question was, uh, you know, are we seeing a lot of uh, the HFTO and how it's affecting uh, the rotor steer bolt? I was no. Okay, so that's a good question. Yeah, I mean, um, we uh, we try to incorporate, you know, downhole sensors to to support um, the our, our clients with optimizing how the wells are drilled, identifying things like HFTO or or maybe inefficient drilling practices and things like that. I mean, I think it's very location and, and um, rig specific and, and BHA design and things like that, that basically drive what they see and, and how we um, how we can remedy the situation, um, you know, and getting back to, you know, passing those learnings on. Um, some clients are very open to, to, to uh, taking that information and make adjustments. And then to your point, you know, once one is tainted and they don't want to run a steer, well, they done, then they don't, and, and they're, they're done with the situation. So 
um, yeah, we, we try to do what we can to, to, to mitigate some of that. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Paul. No, no problem. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks to you too, Paul. Thank you. Yep, yeah, of course. Should we uh, describe for you what the um, menu options are here at Landry's uh, since you're sitting uh, here? I don't think I want to know. <laughs> All right. Thanks very much. So with that, we'll uh, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. I want to thank um, everybody that participated, uh, Chris for uh, helping to put this together and to host it, and uh, DTech for their their sponsorship as well. I'm getting sign language from Cheryl in the back. Oh, golf tournament! Yep, and um, we are pretty well full. The golf tournament is uh, pretty well full up, so we're sold out for that. So um, hopefully it stays away so we can have uh, the second one for that. So. So everybody enjoy the lunch. Uh, we got plenty of uh, time here. Uh, so enjoy that and talk amongst everybody. And uh, I'll sign off of Zoom as soon as I can get my mouse back over onto the right spot. So thanks again. What's that?